Hello, everyone. Um, very happy to be with you. Um, you know, we all watch, we, we join each other on Zoom a lot. And we even like if you watch the news, you see people on Zoom from their homes. I apologize. I, I have the low tech version, you know, where you sort of look up at the bottom of my face from the because I don't have a high tech camera. <laughs> like uh, some of the people we see on TV zooming from home. Um, anyway, let me outline for you uh, briefly what I intend to talk about today. We have uh, a three hour workshop. It's a long time. Uh, we're going to have a couple of breaks, but I am the editor um, in chief or co-editor along with Carl Bielfeld, who's professor emeritus from Stanford University of the uh, Soto Zen text project. So I want to tell you just a little bit about that. That's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the the work of translating Zen texts, specifically uh, texts uh, by Dogen, the founder of Soto Zen in Japan, and Keizan, his Dharma heir, several generations down. Uh, and and to talk about that, I'm going to give you just a little bit of historical background. Uh, so so those are the first two parts of my talk, and I think we'll take a break after that. Uh, and uh, Bokushu, did we say we we're gonna have some questions after that too, right? Um, yes. Okay. And then I'm getting into the meat of the talk, which is, you know, a, a close reading line by line, and I'll, I'll screen share it for you, um, of my translation of Genjo Koan, you know, in our Soto Zen text project. That was a draft. So you see, it's actually filled with uh, Japanese terms and stuff. Uh, makes it a little bit hard to read, but I left all that in there so that the uh, editor of Shobo Genzo, Carl, he gets the final word. He went over it and uh, changed my translation. I, you know, of course we argued a lot, but he, <laughs> he's, he's got final say for that. Uh, so it, the, uh, the realized koan, the other translation that it was, I sent out for you uh, is what's actually gonna get published. Uh, not mine. So we'll get, well, line by line, uh, it's not a very long text, Genjo Koan, Koan, it's very meaty. It's very interesting, you know, I'll give you some insight into uh, Dogen's Zen, Dogen's way of thinking and, and what he's trying to say. Um, so that's part three. And then part four, I do uh, intend, like I'll open things up to questions and discussion on anything that I talked about earlier, or also anything you might want to know, you know, I about Zen in Japan, because I did spend a number of years in Japan and 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 have gone there nearly every year for the last 45. Uh, and uh, you know, so I, I know a lot about the, the current situation of Zen Buddhism in Japan and also the history. So if any of you have sort of questions about that, which are not directly on uh, the topic of translation or Genjo Koan, that's fine. I'm happy to entertain uh, those kind of questions, okay? So that's the outline of what I want to do. And I'll move right into part one, the Soto Zen text project. Uh, this got started 25 years ago. It was 1995, I think. Maybe I first heard about, you know, I got some feelers um, was actually uh, Bernie Glassman and Reb Anderson were behind this. And, and you know, they expressed to the, the, the Soto Shu Shumucho, the administrative headquarters of Soto Zen in Tokyo, uh, a desire for translations of basic texts of Dogen, Keizan, and also of uh, text used in various rituals. And uh, so I was invited along with Carl uh, Bielefeld and uh, so Reb Anderson, Bernie Glassman, Kaz Tanahashi, Carl Bielefeld and I were all in Japan and you know having a big meeting at, at the uh, administrative headquarters talking about this translation project and, and we got it started and we decided uh, it, it sort of settled on something that would be quite scholarly and uh, you know academic and rigorous, a lot of the translations 
that were done before that were done sort of, typically it would be um, a Japanese Zen teacher, like maybe Mayazumi Roshi and a bunch of his students in the seventies, you know, sitting around and, you know, they're gonna translate quote unquote Shobo Genzo. So someone who could read it in Japanese would read it out loud and then everyone would sort of discuss, oh, that's interesting, you know, um, you know, maybe we should translate this this way, maybe we should translate that that way. So we, there were a lot of sort of team translations that came out, some of them sounding really nice in English, uh, like Kaz Tanahashi's translation of Shobo Genzo is like that. You know, it's beautiful. It actually sounds a lot nicer than our Soto Zen text project translation, I have to say. Uh, beautiful English and poetic. Uh, but then the scholar in me says, unfortunately, it's not that true to the original. So there's problems with it. Um, and um, so this project, we, we determined to translate all the writings of Dogen, uh, starting with Shobo Genzo, but he has other writings as well about monastic rules and the writings of Kazan. And so far to date, this project, we've published uh, Soto scriptures for daily services and practices. I don't know, do you guys use that at all? So like a little uh, uh, hand, you know, green covered handbook, a chance for daily services. You know, yeah, you know, it's a little bit discouraging for us and it's like project that was published in 2001 and so many Zen centers never heard of it or never got it. Okay, whatever. Um, we, yeah, are. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we, we actually do use it as kind of to check the uh, services that we receive from Maizumi Roshi and Bernie. Ah, so right. You use it and we say, well, what? what it's a reference. It? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's really what it was meant to be. It's great. Right? Yeah, okay. So, um, but Roshi, were you there at one of those meetings at Green Gulch where we were like hammering out? Uh, it was quite interesting. You know, there were... Uh, Zen teachers from all over the U.S. and a few from Europe too, like, and everyone had their own like tradition, their own version of everything, the Heart Sutra, <laughs> you know, you name it, and everyone's wedded to their versions. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. That's the way so it is. <laughs> I, I guess we never really thought that this was going to supplant, uh, you know, this sort of in-house handed down traditional chants. Right, but it's, but, a, it's, it's, it's great. It's, yeah, okay, so that was our first publication. Then the second one, which I translated, it's two big fat volumes, Standard Observances of the Soto Zen School. Um, and, you know, if I don't, that also, anyone who wants that, if you send me an email, I'll send you a, uh, a free PDF of it. <laughs> do you have it, Roshi? <laughs> you must have the book, right? I do. I yeah. got the book, but I wouldn't yeah. mind a PDF because, you know, everything is electronic. Anyway. Yeah, PDF is like way easier to search. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, and then uh, in 2017, and then it was two volumes, uh, Record of the Transmission of Illumination, that's uh, Kazan's uh, Den Koroku. So that was a group translation, but I was the final editor of that. So that came out. And then I'm happy to say that... Um, the, the huge project, the, the, the bulk of what we've been doing is Shobo Genzo. So 95 chapters of Dogen's Shobo Genzo, we translate that as uh, treasury of the true Dharma eye. Um, that, you know, we're finishing the publication by this, dis I mean, the, the translation and annotation and everything by December. And it's gonna be proofread and everything. So it'll be published in Japan by the administrative headquarters in 2021. Um, the Denkoroku, Record of the Transmission of Illumination, I'm now finishing up uh, corrections. It's gonna be published uh, this coming year by University of Hawaii Press. And it will also be available eventually after some time period where Hawaii can sell X number of copies, it'll be available like free on the Soto, on the uh, administrative headquarters website. Um, okay, so that's about the, the, the project. Uh, now, let me say something, this is part two about translating 
early Japanese Zen texts. So we're mainly talking here about the works of Dogen. He lived from 1200 to 1253. And uh, Kazan, he lived 1264 to uh, 1325. And these are complex works. They're written in Japanese. Of course, it's the classical grammar Japanese. It's the Japanese of the 13th and 14th century. So anyone who's studying Japanese today uh, would not be able to read this. Uh, you know, you have to learn the classical language. It, it's kind of like relates as maybe if you knew modern Italian, could you read Latin? Well, yeah, sort of, <laughs> but you're not very well. Okay, so that's that's kind of the relationship. Um, and Dogen and Kazan are writing in Japanese for their Japanese disciples, but they're constantly quoting um, blocks of, of classical Chinese text. So um, to translate this stuff, you have to be able to class translate the classical Chinese as well as the, um, the classical Japanese. That's just, you know, problems of, of language, right? You have to know these languages. So now both Dogen and Keizan were pioneers of Zen Buddhism in Japan, uh, which was transmitted from China during the Kamakura period in Japanese history. So 1185 to 1333. It, it's really around the year 1200 that Japanese monks start going to China and finding this new form of Buddhism called Chan in Chinese or Zen in Japanese and bringing it back to Japan. Um, you know, Buddhism was first introduced into Japan a lot earlier uh, from China and Korea in the sixth and seventh centuries. And they're the so-called Nara schools of Buddhism that are the oldest ones. Uh, then there was a second wave of Buddhism coming from China in the ninth century. It was called the Heian period of Japanese history, 794 to 1185. And that second wave gave rise to the Tendai school of Buddhism in Japan and the Shingon, which is the tantric school of Buddhism in Japan. Um, and Zen Buddhism, starting in the Kamakura period after 1185, um, represents a third wave of Buddhism coming from China. So um, Zen uh, or Chan in Chinese became dominant in China during the Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279. You know, it was around earlier. Um, so in the, in the eighth, ninth, uh, 10th century. But what happened in during the Song Dynasty in, in the second half of the 10th century and for the next uh, many hundreds of years, um, Zen Buddhism became the dominant form of uh, officially state approved monastic Buddhism in China. Um, so with the um, advent of the Kamakura period 1185, uh, what happened was th this was a period of feudal rule of Japan by samurai warlords. And, and you know, they had previously been in the employ of these uh, aristocrats and elites and the imperial court and land owning, you know, wealthy clans um, who had been patrons of Tendai and Shingon Buddhism. But these warlords figured out uh, at the start of the Kamakura period that actually they had all the power. Why should they listen to aristocrats? and wealthy landowners and act as their cops. Why don't they just take the whole thing themselves? And they did, okay? And these were sort of like these illiterate peasant warriors. Uh, they became a kind of a nouveau riche. They were newly politically powerful. And they were very interested in the latest Buddhism coming from China, which was Zen, because that gave them cultural cachet. It gave, and they, they began patronizing Zen monasteries, you know, you hear stuff like, oh, that's because Zen's the spirit of the warrior and you're ready to die in battle. And no, not really. What they were interested in was, uh, were the aspects of uh, literati culture that were embedded in Chinese Buddhist uh, monasticism, like things like tea ceremony and poetry and gardens, all the things you associate with uh, Zen in Japan. Um, so anyway, uh, they patronized uh, Zen. And that was their way of sort of not sponsoring the, the Buddhism of the old aristocracy. You know, there were many other pioneers along with Dogen. So Dogen is a pioneer of Zen in Japan. Yeah, he, vi he visited China. He trained in Chinese uh, Zen monasteries. And um, he got Dharma transmission uh, in, in, in China. 
and he came, he came back to Japan and he wanted to set up in Japan the same style of monastic institution, the same kind of practice that he had experienced in China. You know, and there were others like Asai uh, and Eni Ben-En and Nampo Jomyo. These are all really famous Japanese Zen masters who visited China um, in the middle of the 13th century and came back to Japan to set up this new kind of Chinese Buddhism. It looked very foreign to the Japanese. Um, so um, in China, the Zen school developed a very distinctive teaching method, which you're, you're familiar with from koan literature. You know, rather than kind of academic lectures on Buddhist uh, topics um, or sutra exegesis, you know, explaining long-winded explanations of sutras, you, what developed in China was this sort of uh, back and forth question and answer kind of very colloquial way of talking about Buddhism that appealed especially to the literati in, in, in China, to the educated uh, scholar bureaucrats. So you get this style of, of koan literature and, and I know you're all somewhat familiar with it. You have the sayings of the master and they get a question and the answer seems like it might be a non sequitur or it seems strange or it seems shocking, you know, so someone, um, you know, asked Zhao Zhou, what is Buddha? He says, oak tree in the garden. It's like, well, what? what? Did he answer the question? <laughs> you know, is he blowing the guy off? I don't, I don't get it. Uh, of course, Zhao Zhou is an awakened Zen master, so he must mean something profound, even though it looks kind of trite, right? And so this, this is a style of, of, uh, of literature that, and teaching. So, you know, Zen's famous for the shouting and the blow, hitting of Rinzai Zen and so on. But there's a vast body of literature uh, that, that took shape in, in China with uh, recording the, the, dis, you know, the discourses of Zen masters and their disciples in this kind of back and forth repartee, very witty, sometimes iconoclastic. So that's the literature of, of um, Zen, it was being brought into uh, Japan, it was incredible, you know, if you think it's hard to understand in English translation, it is. Well, um, just put yourself back in 13th century Japan, the Japanese, that Japanese and Chinese are not the same language, they're utterly different. You know, the Japanese, for better or worse, borrowed Chinese writing. But Japanese as a language is as different from Chinese as English is absolutely different language family. It's a Ural Altaic language. It's related to Korean very closely. People say it's maybe related to Hungarian, maybe to Finnish, you know, yeah, it's not Chinese, okay? <laughs> and so this, this sort of colloquial Chinese uh, repartee, it was just Greek to them. So, so, so here you have Dogen and Kazan, they're trying to explain this literature and this mode of discourse uh, to their Japanese um, disciples. And they have two ways of doing it. So either they quote a block and then they explain it in Japanese, or sometimes they translate it into Japanese first um, and then explain it in Japanese. So, uh, but there's always some like, here's what the masters from China said, either in Chinese, which is harder, or in Japanese. Thank you, teacher, because now it's easier to understand, right? Um, so anyway, this literature is coming into Japan, but I just want to stress that the monastic institutions in which uh, Zen was embedded in China were not unique to Zen. Uh, the, you know, other schools of Buddhism in China had the same monastic institutions. And those institutions and the same rules and procedures and rituals um, and all major Buddhist monastic institutions in China in the Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279, had uh, absorbed many elements of elite Confucian culture. So Dogen is very interested in Chinese poetry. Now, you know, that, that's, uh, if you were a scholar bureaucrat in, in Song Dynasty China, you, you got in your position by passing tests on the Confucian classics. Um, 
but you were expected to have beautiful calligraphy and to be able to write poems. You know, any intelligent, educated person uh, would be able to write poems. So even um, in you, you, that literati culture, when it moves inside the Buddhist monastic institution, means that the abbots and the elite monks are supposed to be able to express themselves in Chinese poetry. You know, that's why you have like these awakening verses, like, you know, the platform sutra. What is that? That's a poetry contest. Did it ever occur to you? Like, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the head seat uh, writes up his poem and then the illiterate postulant layman, Hui Nung, who becomes the sixth patriarch, you know, he has a better poem. Well, that's sort of amazing since he was uneducated, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, so what, what the Japanese were absorbing from China as Zen, quote unquote, included the literature and the teaching methods and the repartee, but it also included the monastic institutions and the elite literati culture, which really wasn't even Buddhist. You know, you think of Zen gardens in Japan. Well, that kind of garden or Zen tea ceremony, yes, those things came into Japan in the 13th century together with Zen Buddhism. But in China, if you told some elite scholar official that drinking tea was Buddhist, he would laugh at you. And if, and if you told him that his beautiful rock garden had anything to do with Buddhism, he would also laugh. Half these guys hated Buddhism, okay? They were virulently anti-Buddhist and they had all these like Zen looking calligraphy, poetry, gardens, and tea drinking and everything. So I'm just trying to point out that what got called Zen in Japan is, is a mix of uh, Chan Zen Buddhism, really, and then broader Buddhist monastic institutions, and then elite literati culture. And these pioneers, including Dogen and Keizan, are bringing all of this to Japan. Dogen is extremely interested and extreme in Chinese poetry and very proud of his ability to write Chinese poetry that basically his countrymen can't understand, okay? So he is kind of an elitist. <laughs> um, but he's trying hard. So um, anyway, I think uh, what I really want to say here is that Dogen and Kazan themselves were transmitters and translators. I can relate to them because I feel like, yeah, I did that. I went to Japan. I learned about Zen. I came back, you know, now I start translating and I'm trying to like, explain this tradition to people in the West, mostly, you know, Americans. And um, so I can really relate to Dogen in that way. You know, I'm not saying I'm Dogen. I didn't start any monastic institution, but, you know, he's often presented in the Japanese context as some kind of unique genius who popped up out of nowhere. You know, he, yeah, okay, he went to China. We'll down, downplay that. Uh, he's, he's kind of Japan's version of Hegel or Heidegger, whose philosophy is incomprehensible and every great civilization should have an incomprehensible philosopher, <laughs> you know? Uh, but um, really, I don't see Dogen as being, I mean, he is no doubt a genius, right? And, but he's first and foremost, he's a translator and an interpreter of this latest in Chinese uh, Buddhism to the Japanese. So when you when when I'm dealing with his you know that's what we're translating, and the, you know the same thing goes for Kazan really. Um, okay, so I think that's that's part one and two, and I'm um, I'm done with that. Oh, I was going to say a few things about yeah. Okay, I'm going to go on. A few more things about the problems of translating Dogen and Kazan. All right, just quickly. First of all, obviously you need to have the languages. You know. Um, and that's hard. You know, we've, I've been working on this translating for 25 years of Dogen, and I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm getting somewhat competent, <laughs> right? Um, not perfect yet. So th this is hard work. And then the material itself is inherently difficult because the Chinese texts, they're filled with allusions and puns and apparent non sequiturs. So, you know, this is language being used. This is Chinese Zen. 
they're using language to try to point out the inherent limitations of language. Like, and um, the pitfalls of language, like we name things and then we imagine, and, and, and the, the, this naming from the standpoint of Mahayana Buddhism is essentially arbitrary. It's for our own purposes. We look at the world and we divide it up into separate things and we name them, we think of them as more or less permanent, stable entities that, that relate, relate to one another, okay? Um, the Buddhist doctrine of emptiness is teaching that actually none of those things really exists in and of itself, bef like before we name them or apart from our naming, right? So uh, now language is incredibly useful. We're not gonna do without it, but language has these pitfalls. Language produces a lot of suffering, right? Like human beings, we, we can sit around and get all depressed because we're going to die. Like what? I mean, can you imagine a dog? Let's say it's a nice day. It's actually a nice day here, right? I, and I'm healthy. Everything's great. I'm having a nice time with you guys. Um, and then there's this idea, well, we're all going to die. Bummer, right? <laughs> Depressing. <laughs> Uh, can, can you uh, imagine a dog getting depressed because he's going to die? Um, no. I mean, dogs are scared. of. Are they scared of death? No. I think they're scared of like trucks, you know, lions, people with sticks, you know, right? They're scared of pain. I really don't think they probably have the idea of death and probably don't stress a whole lot about what, where am I going to go after I die, you know? Now, this is a major problem of language. Human beings, you know, we have this incredible tool that we can, we can name things, analyze things. Now we write everything down. We have, we have incredible, all of our scientific knowledge and progress. We rule the world through language, right? But language has a huge downside. It makes us suffer terribly. You know, you, you know we, we, we believe in self, we have a narrative, we have a plan, it doesn't work. Oh no, this sucks, you know? <laughs> I just remember Nancy Kerrigan, remember in the Olympics, she got her knee injured or something. She's like, why me? She says, <laughs> that's a koan, you know, it's like, well, she's thinking, yeah, I wish someone else had their knee busted, not me. <laughs> Doesn't fit my narrative. My narrative is, is I get a gold medal in the Olympics. Okay, that's suffering caused by language, you know that? Why don't you just go ice skate and have fun? It's nice, you know? Any, anyway, so, um, I got on a little sidetrack there, but this is language trying to tell you about the pitfalls of language. And that makes the language itself inherently very, very difficult. So that makes translating Zen texts much harder than just translating like uh, instruction manuals for your refrigerator. Although I must say, um, probably we could use more professionalism there too. Um, so anyway, an another big problem with Dogen and, and Kazan is that they, they are constantly quoting Chinese texts. Sometimes they're quoting them in Chinese and sometimes they say the name of the text they're quoting, like as the Lotus Sutra says, and then, okay, then everyone knows that's a quotation from the Lotus Sutra, but often they drop in quotations from Chinese without telling you it's a quotation and without naming the text. and and. Classical Japanese and Chinese don't have quotation marks. So um, often what happened in the past was people reading this didn't realize they're reading a quotation. And then if it gets translated into Japanese, it's even worse. Now, when I was translating Keizan's Denko Roku, I discovered a shocking thing using, I was using digital search of the Chinese canon. And vast swaths of words that scholars previously thought were Kazan talking in Japanese. And they translated it as such into modern Japanese. I discovered, I just, I happened on this and then as soon as I realized this was happening, I systematically looked. I took his Japanese, I put it back into what I guessed might be a Chinese phrase. I searched the canon, the digital canon for that Chinese phrase I find it and I realize, oh my gosh, this entire block is not Kazan talking. It's him quoting something. Now listen, you don't have to be a, a literary genius to realize 
that knowing who's talking is pretty important in understanding something. Okay. And if you miss the quotation marks, you're lost. All right. So I thought of a funny example. Okay. Um, now I want you to imagine an English exchange um, with a question and an answer. And it goes like this. Here's the, here's the exchange in English. I just made this up half an hour ago. Question, who's the boss? Answer, more go ahead, make my day than play it again, Sam. Okay, who understood what I said? More go ahead, make my day than play it again, Sam. All right, in other words, the boss's character is more like Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry, go ahead, make my day, than it is like Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca, play it again, Sam. All right, I'm gonna read one more time. More go ahead, make my day than play it again, Sam. Now, I just imagine that sentence with the quotation marks off it. Is that English? That's not English. It's gibberish. It's not grammatically correct. All right, now, a lot of Dogen looks like that. It's like, oh, what, what, what did he just say? The grammar's wrong, okay? And a lot of people up to now have said, ooh, it's Zen. It's very profound. <laughs> you know, who could understand, you know? And actually, it's, no, it's not Zen. It's missing quotation marks. And you didn't get the illusion. You know, you have to be a Hollywood movie buff. How many of you got the illusion? Play it again, Sam. They're pretty common, right? Dirty Harry may be worse. Like, make my day, you know that one? You know, you can raise your hand. Who knows that one? Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, you got to be a little bit older. If I asked my college students today, yeah, they would have maybe clueless. Okay. So Dogen and Kazan are constantly dropping. That's the way they talk. You know, I'm, we quote Hollywood movies. They're quoting, you know, famous sayings from Zen masters. Some maybe in the original Chinese, maybe in Japanese translation, you know, and if you don't pick that up, you know, you're going to, you're, you're in trouble. Okay. So, um, the, the ability to digitally search this stuff was like groundbreaking. And I have to say, our Soto, I'm really proud of this, our Soto Zen text project, which has Carl Bielfeld, the late Stanley Weinstein, professor emeritus from Yale, William Botterford, um, and we had John McRae also passed away some years ago. And uh, so we had this very high powered, you know, academic team of translators and using digital search, you know, we, we were really able to uh, do a better job on uh, Dogen and Kazan that people have in the past. Okay, I told Bokushu 10 minutes, see, it was, what was it? Uh, 36 minutes, typical professor. <laughs> but uh, all right, we're, we, we can now have a, uh, some question or answer and a... So given what you've just said about the context of language and the puns and the historical setting of all of the koans. Um, I just wonder, as a koan student myself, I wonder, can we ever hope to actually get these right and even understand if we're understanding the koan as they were actually presented? You said, can we even hope? Oh, yes, we can definitely hope. <laughs> But, you know, trying to understand anything, um, I don't care what it is. It could be a koan. It could be, you know, nuclear physics. It could be, you know, how to get your roses to grow and not get blight, you know? I, 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 sure. Um, the, the more you study, the harder you work at it. Yes. Somebody understood it, you know? I mean, that, I operate on the basic hermeneutic principle. That's, that, you know, that's like the principle of interpretation that it's not nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really bothers me when I hear koans described by scholars, you know, eminent scholars who really ought to know better as a kind of nonsensical language. Like, do you think a bunch of really, really smart people for over a thousand years would concern themselves with just like nonsense? <laughs> you know, I, I, that, it, no. They're deep, they have meaning, you know? Uh, so uh, they're not nonsense. They meant, so, you know, now there, there are all kinds of problems, right? 
in like, can you imagine yourself being a, a scholar of American culture and you're 800 years from now and your native language is, I don't know, Chinese, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and you're looking at the golden age of American film, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, would you get that, you know, Dirty Harry and Casablanca reference? Yeah, you probably would. Those are famous. But think of all the other little film things you wouldn't get, right? So, um, I mean, all I can say is that the, the famous koans tend to get repeated and repeated and repeated and commented on over and over again. Uh, one thing we do in our translation project is if Dogen alludes to something, we find the original and, and translate the whole thing. And, and that's why our critical apparatus, the annotation, the glossary is like huge. For one little line in Dogen, you get like a three page, you know, treatise uh, on the background. But, you know, the, you're dealing through, a, unless you kind of look at them in Chinese, right? Uh, then you're dealing with, you're through, you're, you're at the mercy of some translator. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be, it's not such a bad idea for American Zen teachers. You know, why don't you pick something that some Zen teacher said in English? Okay. <laughs> Make that your goal. <laughs> you, at least you won't have the fog of translation, you know, that, 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 that difficulty. Yeah. But actually, you know, I'm a translator, so I have to believe in what I'm doing. I believe that when I translate these koans, you will be able to understand them better. And that's what makes it worthwhile. Okay. You know, so, so yeah, I mean, and you get out of it what you put into it. You know, Kazan, he's really constantly saying, study hard, study hard, just like keep thinking about it un un until you under, finally understand. If you have any doubt left at all, keep thinking about it. So that's like hard work. You know, that's it's a kind of meditation, right? Um, so at the very beginning, um, when you were speaking, uh, Griff, you, you rattled off a bunch of, of, of things that currently, that you've already, uh, the group has already. Right, yeah. And I was wondering, is that the Soto Zen dash net dot or dot jp yeah 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 a lot of it's up there yes okay yeah you know but... we have draft translations of various chapters of shobo genzo that get, get put up there all the time i i think my translation of of den koroku is available up there uh as a pdf you know it's sort of marked with a big it says copyright protected and it's something like got some kind of slash across each page you know but you can read it yeah, I mean, it yeah. says Soto School Scriptures for Daily Services and Practice. Which yeah, yeah, that was that was the first thing we did in our right. project. Cool. Yeah, that, okay. so that's that's, yep, that, that's who you're talking to here. The guys who, who did that stuff, on on that website. Yep. And is that um, so? This the, the my second question was real because I haven't opened any of these yet. Was that was similar was related to what you just said? Is that there's the translation. But then there's the 15 pages of footnotes and commentary that I think are also likely to be useful. And are they also on that site, or is no? That... We we haven't done that. We haven't done that. Okay. Um, you know, it, the now the Denko Roku, you know, it's it's going to be coming out separately, you know, from Hawaii, and I I fixed it up a little bit. But it basically has two volumes. You know, the one volume is the translation. The other volume are the glossaries. Glossaries of terms and phrases and glossaries of names of people, places, and texts. And the glossary is 700 pages long. <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's a dictionary really. Okay. So any term that appears there and it's, you know, it's aimed at, at scholars, but, but people like you who, who, who are practitioners and, you know, and, and you're just interested, you, you can learn a lot from that. You know, it, it, it is kind of academic, you know, talking about questions of translation, right? You know, most people want to say, well, just shut up. Just tell me what it means. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, that's the problem. <laughs> um, 
No, I think, it, I mean, it's, I, I yeah. think it, that's the, that, that I think is actually invaluable. I mean, I, 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 I mean, yeah. I, I've been studying with this group for over 15 years and I yeah. can't tell you the number of times that I encounter a phrase that I've been hearing for 15 years and I actually don't know what it means. Right. right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And I it's good to what ask. What the phrases mean, or I think I do, but there, you know, I still come across things that I've been yeah, hearing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, any, especially like, like the buzzwords we hear all the time, right? Like, democracy like oh right i know what that no, do you like think about it like what what, what are we, you know as soon as you start thinking about it you realize oh it's highly ambiguous the words used you know has a history of use it changes meaning over time you know it's very contextualized you know uh so it just gets complicated fast right democracy is not one thing it's not a thing it's a word and it's a word with a ton of meanings and it's complicated all right so um you know that that sort of problematizing of language you know is what a lot of uh well at least zen koan study is definitely about yeah uh we have found fascinated with the issues of translation and language also uh i have perhaps 40 versions of the Tao Te Ching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's fascinating to read, you know, the same chapters yeah. by 40 different translators. Yeah, amazing. So uh, my question to you was that early on when you first started, you said that some of the newer translations that you've been reading of classic texts, even the Heart Sutra, uh, in your phrase, don't ring true. And so I just wanted you to uh, elaborate a bit on what I you mean did, by did that. I, say that. I don't actually remember saying that. I, I mean, I think I might have said aren't accurate or something like that, didn't I? I remember uh, don't ring well, maybe true. I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. Could you just, you, you get my yeah, drift that well, you, you, you were yeah, dissatisfied I mean, with some of the modern translations. I, went, you know, uh, I wondered what, how you were. It, do you do any translating yourself? No. No. You know, no. It, it, it's like, um, you know, some people grow up bilingual and they just very naturally and spontaneously, you know, um, can find a sort of matching phrase in, the, in other language, right? Um, but for me, what, what, when you read something and you don't understand it, so I'm reading Dogen or I'm reading Kazan and okay, I don't understand it. What am I gonna do? Well, I, I look at other people's translations. I look at a bunch of dictionaries. I look at uh, translations from classical Japanese into modern Japanese and so on. Uh, but what if I still don't understand it? You know, can I translate it? And I think no. I'm blocked because in the past, what translators do, there, there are two ways that translators deal with things they don't understand. One, they decide I'm going to translate very literally, you know, I'll just follow the grammar and the words and I'll just plug it in and I'll get English. That English is almost certainly going to be gibberish, right? But they can say, oh, well, I translated it, you know, it didn't make sense in the original. I didn't understand it in Japanese. I don't understand it in English, but I translated it. You know, to me, that's no good. And then, but what's worse, what usually happened in these group translations of Zen texts is you have a bunch of smart people who are well-educated and, you know, uh, very articulate in English, and they have their own ideas about things. So everyone sits around and they sort of decide like what it ought to mean <laughs> like what we want it to mean. And then they put it into beautiful English. That sounds great. Okay. And it's profound, you know, and I'm not saying it doesn't have profound meaning either. I'm not saying that's like, doesn't lack value. It's just as, as a scholar, I look at that and I'm saying, no, that's actually not what the original says. You know, I mean, I don't understand the original, but I can tell you for sure. It doesn't say that. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and th maybe th I think that's what I meant. You know, that's what I was talking about. Like there's, there's, an, 
if you hold my feet to the fire, like, what do you mean accurate? What do you mean true to the original? Things get tricky fast. How could the translation be true to the original? Like, if, you know, it can't, it's gonna put it in different words. And the different words have different associations. It's not, it's impossible to have an accurate translation, right? Yeah, yeah. a couple, a few years ago, yeah. uh, there was a publication of a bilingual version of Beowulf. Huh. In, in, in translated into modern English, and then page by page, along with the original, I believe it was Middle English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, even English, a few hundred years ago, following it literally line by line, you can't hardly ever pick out a word. Right. The old stuff is, could, might as well be Chinese. Yeah. And so I understand going back to things a thousand or more years ago in a different culture, uh, it's pretty nigh impossible. And I know what you mean by going with either the connotative or uh, meaning or the literal dictionary. Yeah. So the, what I tend to do, and I'm not sure if you think this is a good idea, is read as many different ones as I can. Yeah. And I then sort of uh, <laughs> yeah. incorporate and find my meaning for that. Right. Something that is meaningful for me yeah. that makes sense yeah. by amalgamating. I mean, uh, Sure, I think that I think that's the right thing to do. After all, like if it's not meaning for you, well, then right. what what good is it, right? Yeah. Right. But you know, at the same time, you should be aware. You know, I have to be humble too. Like, yeah, this is what I understood. You know, I'm, I'm Carl Bielfeld, the other equally competent editor, doesn't understand that the same way I do. You know. And, I look for the basic and, meaning. Yeah. What is what are they trying to say right. in a way that I yeah. Yeah. can hear it? Right. Or that it, it you know, is. for me, a big test is can you um, not only, you know, you're following the logic of what's being said, so you can guess what's coming next. That's a kind of test, right? And if you're surprised by what comes next, and it just doesn't seem to fit, you know, maybe you're not following the thread, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, you know, for sure in, in our translation project, you are the target audience for us. Okay. So we not only give you a translation, you know, of uh, Genjo Koan, you can compare to the other 12 on the web. All right. <laughs> but I gave you a ton of notes. Okay. On uh, like on each term, yeah, and, that, you know, that puts you kind of inside the mind of the translator. And I'm, as translator, I'm just saying openly, I don't understand this. It might mean this. It might mean that. Okay. And, and that's honest translation. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll end here. But I think that this is what you started out by talking about, which is the, the inherent limitations of words and language yeah. Yeah. To, to transmit experience. Yeah. They can't do it. All right. Well, I mean, we try, we approximate, right? <laughs> we, we just can't do it perfectly, but we, but we can do it better or worse. Anyway, yeah. I'm a professional musician and I've worked with a lot of composers, uh -huh. contemporary composers, and they write a piece and I interpret what they write. I even had a piece commissioned for me. Now, when I go back and I'm working with a duet with a, uh, another flutist and I go back to the composer for coaching, they always want to change what they've written. <laughs> like that creative process of, yeah. of creating a new and, right. um, you know, every time I play it with somebody else, it's interpreted differently. Every right. time I perform it, it's interpreted differently. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we present koans to Roshis or senseis and, you know, they're, they're like, nope, that's not it. It's nope, that's not it. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, it's all interpretation. Well, you know, mm -mm -mm. yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> 
do you do you ever go listen if you think at... your interpretation is just as good as your roshi's we'll stay home <laughs> <laughs> well no like do 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 you ever go back and and reinterpret what you've what you've read and what you know you're what trying it, it, to translate of course you do well first of all dogen you know he goes and rewrites stuff you know you know same problem you have <laughs> with a composer it's like oh no <laughs> make up your mind uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, think about your musician. So, you know, I think you rep, you can see things like skill levels, like a beginner, someone with basic confidence, and someone who really is a virtuoso, okay? I think you can tell that, right? Yeah. And, and so would you say, oh, well, it's, you know, some kid playing, eh, 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 you know, that it's just her interpretation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, if you're trying to learn music, you go to the virtuoso to study, right? And, and when your Roshi looks at you and says, no, it's not your answer. It's your virtuosity that's showing, okay? <laughs> or lack thereof. Or lack thereof, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I, I found a book of Japanese at my mother's house when I was paring down for her and um, one word had like 600 different meanings. Yeah. And I found a lot of um, understanding in Okamura's um, and Uchiyama's translations of these things as well as causes. Yeah, yeah. Tra yeah. Translation. Yeah, Shohaku Okamura, I forgot to name. He was also there in that first initial uh, sort of planning meeting of our uh, Zen text project back in 95. Yeah, he, he's a great translator too. But, you know, he follows what he learned from his teacher, you know, kind of, um, there's a Soto party line. It's almost like dogma on what things would mean. See, I didn't mention this, but difficult passages over time. I mean, this happens in music too. It's like, how come certain performances always get performed the same way, you know, and, and right? And, 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 and then someone is going to come along and speed it up, slow it down, use different, you know, use old instrument, like, like jazz it up a little bit, right? But there's a sort of the same old, same old way that Mozart gets played, right? You know, and, and, and um, so th there were these difficult passages from Dogen or Kazan, no one could figure out, and some bright intellectual scholar monks gave an interpretation and it became like orthodoxy, <laughs> you know? And, and, and that's what the Soto tradition has been telling us for the last 500 years. This is what it means, you know, but they didn't have digital search and maybe they didn't even realize that there was a hidden quote in there. You know, they got it wrong. So, you know, now Carl, my, my colleague, he's Mr. Let's not offend our patrons who are, you know, the Soto school. You can't say this, he says to me, because that's overturning the Soto, you know, orthodoxy. And I'm like, I don't care. You know, <laughs> I think this is what I think it means based on philological head anyway. Yeah. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> okay. Keep up the music. <laughs> so, um, now what you see here, I trust you can all see it, right? The treasury of the true Dharma eye, it's an obvious case. This is, this is the translation, the draft translation that I first did some years ago, and then I gave it to Carl Bielfeld, and he edited it. And one of the things he did was uh, sort of rein in, where, where I strayed from Soto orthodoxy, he, uh, he, back, he, he sort of went back to a more standard interpretations. So if you look at his notes, you know, his uh, version is got the title, The Realized Koan. And I had this like, this is a long standing argument I'm having with Carl. Like I, I said to him, Carl, what does the realized koan mean anyway? You know, I'm gonna like, if you hear that, does that make any sense to you? The realized koan. Anyone wanna volunteer? Because I, you know, I, I'm like, wait a minute. Is that, that's a, the verb to realize in the passive voice. Like, so I wanna know realized by who? Who realized it, right? Or another meaning of realize is like um, a dream come true. Your dream is realized. 
you know, or some bond matures and your, you know, your, your money, your, uh, a realized stock or something like that. I, I just don't know what realized call on means, but unfortunately that's going to be, <laughs> um, there's, there's the, the problem of what does koan mean? You know, most, most of you, uh, obviously you've heard this word. Uh, if you read the notes that are, the, there's a whole bunch of notes attached to this. I explain the etymology of the term koan in, in, in great detail. Um, but I'll start with that because um, many of you have not read that. Uh, the Chinese word is gong an, and it actually means the, a magistrate or, or a judge's desk or bench. So it, it, it exactly, you know, we say the bench in law before the bench, that's what a call on is. It's, it, it's, it's the table, the bench behind which the judge sits and he's like up high and the judge is in a position of authority. And um, if, you know, the accused come before the judge and, you know, the evidence is presented and in, in a traditional Chinese court, um, the judge will declare, you know, innocence or uh, guilt of the accused. And, and they would actually um, administer punishment sometimes right in the court. So someone, yeah, you're guilty of stealing the chicken and the punishment is 30 blows. So the, the uh, criminal, you know, the convicted criminal would be beaten right there in the court 30 times. You know, when I think about that, and I think about our criminal justice system with, you know, jailing and bond and, you know, the racial disparities in it. I'm just like, really, is, is that Chinese system any worse? I, I don't know. I, I, I'd rather just be beaten in court and then let out. I don't know. Personally, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, uh, uh, this is actually a metaphor. So the, the, the very famous the original use of this term in Zen texts is um, Zen master Mujo saw a monk coming in through the gate of the monastery and he said to him, yours is an obvious case, but I spare you the 30 blows. So he said to him, Genjo Koan, it's a clear cut case. Your case is obvious. So koan is a case in court. Okay. So this, this Zen master was using a metaphor which set himself up like I'm the judge, I'm the magistrate. You're walking in through the gate, the monk coming to study with him is, is kind of in the position metaphorically of the accused. Now in a real court of law, you know, you're accused of a crime like theft or something. Um, in this metaphorical context of the Zen text, uh, what what stand what what are guilt and what are innocence? Well, if if you guilt is like delusion, you're deluded. Innocence is well, you're you know you're awakened, you get it, you pass, you're not guilty. So the master is in a position of judging the state of mind of the student, and uh, in so this. Monk walks in the gate of the monastery and to see the master is I want to be your student. I want to study Zen. I want to, I want to be awakened or something. Right. Um, and the master says, you're obviously deluded. You're obviously guilty. And, you know, there in, in Japanese Zen, you know, sometimes I read this stuff like, Oh, the Zen master, he can tell by the way the disciple walks that he's deluded. Really? That's kind of nonsensical. Or, or, or you can look at someone's calligraphy and, and tell whether they're awakened or not. Come on, <laughs> seriously? Um, what does awakened calligraphy look like? Um, it, it, it's almost absurd, you know? Uh, so how does the master know what, what makes the monk who's walking in the gate of the monastery obviously guilty, right? You know, it'd be like you show up at Village Zendo and you say, hey, you know, I, I sort of want to check things out here. I, I, I mean, I'm interested in Zen. And you're told right to your face, um, 
get out of here, you're deluded. Or maybe not get out of here, but well, you're deluded. But I'll spare you the 30 blows. So, so, so <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> okay. So anyway, there are all these, how to interpret this. What makes, what makes the case an obvious one? And my interpretation of this, you know, just to cut to the chase is to come through the gate and to seek uh, awakening, which is the goal of Zen practice, is to have in mind some kind of fantasy state, some kind of idea of perfection. You know, you, you think there's this thing awakening that you don't have and you're going to get it. And that's, that's deluded. So just to seek the Dharma already makes you deluded. Uh, but what's the alternative? Don't seek the Dharma? Just sit there and wallow in your delusion? It, no. So you sort of, this is like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, okay? Yeah. If you seek the Dharma, you're deluded. And if you don't, well, it's even worse. How are you ever going to get out of your delusion? Mm -hmm. okay? so, so that's sort of the issue here. Um, and when, you know, in this text, Dogen once quotes this. He said, you know, so I'm wondering why, why does he call this text Genjo Koan? In, in, in most of Dogen's writings um, in Shobo Genzo, many, many of them are koan commentaries. And he virtually always quotes the koan in Chinese. And then he goes on to discuss it. And sometimes he quotes other koans that are related and he discusses them. So here he doesn't actually, that, that koan, a monk came in through the gate and Mujo said, yours is an obvious case, but I spare you the 30 blows. Dogen doesn't actually quote that koan here, which is a little odd, but he definitely has it in mind, I think, okay? Um, now, this title in, in Soto Zen became a big problem uh, about 100 years ago, you know, during the Meiji period. Buddhism in Japan was under attack. Uh, you know, you, you probably don't know this, but uh, in, the 18, in the 1870s, 80% of the Buddhist monasteries in Japan were destroyed. 80% leaving only 20. And if you were in that 20%, what would you be thinking? You know, like, we're toast. <laughs> Buddhism's had it here. So uh, Buddhists in Japan and Zen Buddhists too were struggling really hard to make themselves relevant to the modern age. And they were accused of being superstitious and backward and, you know, uh, like absorbed in nonsensical rituals, nothing to do with science. Um, so Anyway, uh, part of the sort of resuscitation of Zen in Japan at that period involved Soto people saying, um, well, we don't use koans. Now, that's kind of crazy when you look at the writings of Dogen and, and Keizan. They're, they're filled with koans. But you still hear this today, that Rinzai Zen is koan Zen, and Soto Zen is not. So, Soto Zen is shikantaza, just sitting, no koan. Um, so, you know, it is true that in Rinzai Zen, you're supposed to meditate on your koan while you're sitting in Zazen. And also the rest of the day, you know, when you're working or eating or sleeping. Uh, and in Soto Zen, traditionally, um, you know, they're not telling you that you should meditate on your koan in Zazen. But Dogen and Kazan are constantly telling their students to meditate on their koans. You know, so um, anyway, in the Soto tradition in the 20th century, the idea that uh, Dogen would be talking about koans, it's kind of a problem for them. So they come up with all kinds of uh, uh, ways of explaining why this word is there other than the obvious reason it's there. So um, anyway, let, let's get into the text itself and I'll come back to why I think he used that title. Um, but there's something, the title, Genjo Koan, it's an obvious case means that the master can see delusion clearly. All right, that, that's really what it means. If the student is clinging on to some ideas in a deluded way, 
the master can clearly see it. Okay. Um, so then the, the text starts like this. Uh, at the times, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for all this, you know, these Chinese characters and Japanese pronunciations shoved in here. That's because I did this so that uh, the editor would know what I had translated as what. And, you know, we're trying to standardize translations of terms. So for you reading it in English here, it's all cluttered up. It's a big mess. Uh, it makes it hard to read. But, you know, I, I just thought, listen, I'll show you this. You can see what it looks like. It's sort of a draft. And if you want to see how it ended up without all the clutter, go read Carl's uh, The Realized Koan, which I also sent to you. Okay. Um, and, and you'll see that he follows what I translated pretty closely and changes it in some places. Um, but at the, okay, let's start reading the text. At the times uh, when all dharmas are the Buddha Dharma, just then there are delusion and awakening. There is practice, there is birth, there is death, there are Buddhas and there are living beings. Um, so all dharmas are the Buddha Dharma. I take this to mean, look, dharmas means whatever really exists in the world. So if we're talking about what really exists in the world from the standpoint of the teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma, then we're going to talk about delusion and awakening. That's a basic way that Buddhists divide up the world. Buddhas are awakened beings and then living beings, they're ordinary, they're not Buddhas. So that, you know, Buddhas and beings, uh, Buddhas and living beings is, is like a pair that are always contrasted. Buddhas are awakened, living beings are caught up in delusion. Uh, Buddhas have somehow escaped from suffering in the round of rebirth or samsara. Um, that's birth and death. And living beings are caught up in birth and death. All right. Um, and there's, there's, so from the Buddhist point of view, there's such a thing as samsara, there's birth and death. To be caught up in it is suffering. You want to escape from that. The way to do it is through practice. And um, you can attain awakening. You can become a Buddha. And in, in a certain way, you can get out of birth and death. Now, you know, in the early Buddhist tradition, nirvana, getting out of birth and death, really meant the non-arising of dharmas. So it's kind of like almost a nothingness. In, in, in Mahayana Buddhism, getting out of birth and death means realizing the emptiness of dharmas. So you stay in the world as a bodhisattva acting out of compassion for all living beings. So stay involved in birth and death. The bodhisattva vows not to go to nirvana in the old, old meaning of nirvana. Uh, until all living beings can be saved, which is really effectively uh, never. But anyway, this whole first paragraph um, uh, or sentence it is really just saying, yeah, this is how Buddhists talk. They divide the world up into Buddhas and ordinary beings, delusion and awakening and practice. Okay. Um, and then the very next sentence, he says, but, you know, is an implied but. At the times when the 10,000 dharmas are all without self-existence. And here, uh, you know, Carl translates more literally as all not self. Okay. Um, there is no delusion. There is no awakening. There are no Buddhas. There are no living beings. There is no arising and no cessation. So in this second sentence, what was given in the first sentence, which is the vocabulary and the categories of thought of Buddhism, is immediately taken away. He's, like, he's saying, well, there's no such thing as delusion. There's no such thing as awakening. Those are just ideas. They're just words. They're empty concepts. You know, they have a function. Um, in, from the standpoint of uh, sort of skillful means, it's not bad to have these ideas. It's not bad to realize that you're deluded and you want to be awakened. Um, but 
part of what delusion is, is thinking there's such a thing as delusion. Thinking there's such a thing as awakening. It's something out there and other people have it. Like Roshi has it and I don't, you know? Like, uh, and if you ask Roshi, I'm sure she's going to tell you, no, she doesn't have it. Like, what a dumb idea, okay? And that's why she's a Roshi, okay? So, um, anyway, this, I look at these first two sentences, um, first two statements in terms of the Buddhist uh, doctrine of two truths. So, um, maybe you've heard of this. There's ultimate truth, and then there's conventional truth. These, these are kind of widely misunderstood. You know, people imagine ultimate truth. Okay, well, that's ultimate truth. You know, you can't be put into language. So ultimate truth must be some kind of immediate experience of awakening. And then conventional truth is like this secondary talking about it. Okay. Um, that's wrong. That's completely wrong. That's not, there is no such thing as ultimate truth. All right. There are no things. That's the doctrine of emptiness, especially no such thing as ultimate truth. What a dumb idea. Did you ever see one? You know, I'm not sure I ever saw one like walking down the street. Did you invite one in to have some tea? Like what's an ultimate truth look like? All right. So, um, it's not, what, do we, what does the Buddhist tradition, this is Mahayana Buddhism, especially the uh, Madhyamaka school that informs Zen very deeply. The two truths are two criteria for judging the truth of a statement. That's all they are. All right. So you have a conventional criteria for judging the truth or falsity of some statement you hear. All right. And it has to do with what we've agreed that words are going to mean. It also has to do with logic. And it has to do with truthfulness. Like, is, you know, it, it, it's possible to use words in their agreed upon meaning in a very logical way, and you're lying. Okay. So there are a lot of ways for judging things on the level of conventional truth. We can say, no, that's not true because it's nonsense, it's not logical. Uh, we could say, no, that's not true because I can see with my own eyes. Like, you know, if I said, uh, you know, my name is Sally Smith. Okay. Do you think I'm telling the truth? You know, it, it, it could be, uh, but it's probably not. Um, so on the, the level of conventional truth is what all of us understand when we say judging the truth of a statement, right? It's, that's the level in which Donald Trump, you know, he flunks big time all the time on the level of conventional truth. He's lying, okay? And he's saying stuff that's nonsensical and things that, that we know from scientific understanding are false, et cetera, okay? Now, so what is the criteria of ultimate truth, all right? This is the criteria that takes the emptiness of dharmas as its standard. So the basic principle here is there is no such thing as a thing. What we imagine when we, we have the word thing, it's everywhere in the language and there's no language without it. We have the concept of a thing. But what do you mean? Here's a good word to think about. What the heck do you mean? And you know this word very well, no problem with it. What do you mean when you say thing? What's a thing? Hmm? Huh? You know, you know, so you, you can give examples. Oh, you know, a pencil, a book, a car. No, no, a person. No, no. What's what do you mean when you say thing? So if you really think about this, I'm gonna propose we we there's a set of ideas we have with that word. We we definitely mean that it's singular, it's one thing. Because if it's more than one, you're going to say things, plural, okay? And we, we kind of mean that the thing, it is what it is. It's not something else. You know, a thing is divided off from other things. You know, like, um, 
a thing is it has to be a thing has to be separate a thing is not everything although everything's everything's a kind of thing right but if it, but if a thing has to be separate and everything's a thing what's everything separate from okay that's a koan if everything returns to the one where does the one return okay well there's no such thing as a one that's a dumb idea okay and that's where it returns but anyway uh there's, so there's no such thing as a thing because we, we imagine something that's unchanging, that's clearly distinguished from everything else, that has a kind of essence, and, it, it, and it's separate from everything else. It may be related to other things, but it's separate from them. Now, if you look in the real world, are there any things like that? And, and the Buddhists would say, no. You know, it's, it's, thing is an empty concept. Useful idea, but there aren't any. Now I'll give you some other easier to understand ideas of empty concepts. How about a circle or any geometric shape? Um, that's defined in mathematics, right? All the points on the line equidistant from some center point. Okay. Um, are there any actual circles in the world? Is there anything in the real world that you can observe and measure and it meets the definition of circle? No. How about that thing you draw with a protractor and your pencil on a piece of paper? It's a really nice circle. You know, if I try to draw a circle by hand, I get what the Japanese call ichi enso, you know, like those Zen circles. They're really cool. Um, one, one thing of ink, right? But it, it's not really very round. What about, okay, I drew it with a protractor on a piece of paper. Wait a minute. So now you're going to measure from the center where the pointy thing went in to the, are you going to measure to the inside of your pencil line or the outside of your pencil line? Huh? Or somewhere in the middle of your pencil line. Is that a circle? Is that even a line? Is there such a thing as a line? No. Is there such a thing as a circle? No. Okay, what are these? <laughs> useful concepts. <clears throat> is, is circle a useful concept? Very. When we're making machinery, we want to reduce friction. So we, we realize, you know, round things roll better than things with bumps on their edges. I want the tires on my car to be round. If you get a, you know, a tire with a bump in it, it's like bum, 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 terrible, right? So we make ball bearings as round as we can, the thousandths of an inch. Now put it under a electron microscope. Is that thing round? No, it's pitted, it's disgusting. It's nothing round about it, okay? It's as round as we can make it. Is it, is it rounder than some other thing? Yeah, so look, round is an ideal, which you can come closer to or further away from, okay? Things are more or less round. It's a useful concept, but actually nothing's round. So. The idea of a thing is just like this. Thing is a useful concept, but actually, when you come right down to it, there are no things like that. All right. Now, I don't want to, you know, either you can understand that or not. Okay. Um, think about it. But if there are no things, how could you have language? Every single noun we have is a name for a thing. Okay. And every single noun we have, like imagines, like I, I say tree, I'm looking at a tree out my window. Okay, I'm thinking of as one three, tree, it's definitely a tree, it's not, it's not a bush, you know, it's not the sky, it's not the ground it's growing in. You know, I'm thinking of it as a separate thing. Uh, and I have the word and you understand the word and you, you can get even the picture I'm giving you without me flipping my computer around and showing you in my tree. So, um, but, I'm looking at a tree from the standpoint of ultimate truth is a false statement. And because there's no such thing as I, and there's no such thing ultimately as a tree. All right. These are, that's only conventionally true that I'm looking at a tree. Although, you know, maybe I could be even lying to you, in which case it'd be, you know, conventionally false. Okay. But trust me, I'm looking at a tree. And that's conventionally true, but it's ultimately false. So look, any sentence that has a noun in it 
is going to be false from the standpoint of conventional truth. All right. Uh, so that's why if you're looking at everything from the standpoint, this, coming back to Dogen here, at the times when the 10,000 dharmas are all without self-existence. In other words, there, dharmas are things. There really are no such things as that, as we imagine. There are no things at all. It, it's not that there's nothing. No one's saying there's nothing. There's a real world. It's there. You live in it. You are it. You eat it. You sleep it. You know, you crap it. Okay, it's the real world. It hurts. It feels good. It, no, these Buddhists are not saying there's no real world. There's just, they're just saying the real world is not made up of a bunch of things like we imagine. You, as soon as you go to describe it, you start carving it up into, into imaginary things. And for good reason, very useful to figure out what's what, what to expect, how to get food, how to get along. It's got incredible survival value language, okay? Um, but when you realize that ultimately there are no such things, they're just conventional names, conventionally true, yeah. Uh, then the sentence, the second sentence, there, there is no such thing as delusion. There's no such thing as awakening. You know, there's no Buddhas. You can go on. There are no living beings. There's no trees. There are no people. There's no world. There's no ultimate truth. You know, just like that. So that's why these these two sentence, sentences represent conventional truth. Yes, from the standpoint of Buddhism, conventionally speaking, there are Buddhas and beings. There is birth and death. There is delusion and awakening. Useful knowledge, practical. Go with it. It's like saying, yeah, there's circles. There really are circles. It's circles a useful concept. It's good for engineering. It's good for like you know, when I have a round table discussion and it feels egalitarian. It's nice. Okay, There's all kinds of good reasons for circles, but um, ultimately. There's no such thing as a circle. That's what's going on here. Um, and then he, he, go, he goes on. Because the way of the Buddhas from the start has sprung out. This, this word here, cho sets the spring out. You know, I, from fertility and barrenness, you know, I'm, I'm still not sure what this means. You can look at Carl's explanation. Um, I guess fertility and barrenness, you know, it's sort of an agricultural metaphor, right? You know, have a barren field or you have a field that's growing crops. Uh, human beings like, you know, we live off of agriculture, so fertile's good, barren's no good. If you're thinking about animal husbandry or just human beings having children, I guess, fertile's good, barren's no good. Uh, anyway, you know, we have, we have plenty of stuff to eat. We have none. I mean, that's, human beings are all worried about fertility and barrenness in any kinds, many, many, many kinds of ways. Of course we are, right? Uh, and, he, and I take this to mean that Buddhist teachings come out of this real life we live, of, you know, birth and death. So, and therefore, there's delusion and awakening. Therefore, uh, okay. Now, this, this standard Soto Zen interpretation of this word, uh, Choshutsu is to transcend. So um, the way of the Buddhas transcends fertility and barrenness. It goes beyond dualities. It's somehow talking about awakening. I mean, that, that's how Carl's translation takes it. And that's because he is following the standard Soto interpretation. He doesn't like what I did here. Okay. And I could be wrong, right? I, I'm, you know, I'm saying I don't really understand it. Uh, but the logic of this, you know, if the way of the Buddhas is transcendent, then why would it have delusion and awakening? You know, it sort of just doesn't logically follow to me. Um, and, and then this gets really interesting. What is more, although the way of the Buddhas is like that, the simple fact is that blossoms fall, even though we cherish them and weeds grow even though we loathe them. Um, I mean, yeah, we like cherry blossoms and we don't like weeds. Um, but these are natural phenomena and the cherishing 
and the loathing are the human overlay, right? That's what we think about it. Um, you know, there, I don't know, there, there, there could be some other animals sharing this world with us that uh, like, there's a woodchuck living in my backyard. I think he loves the weeds. You know, some of them are really good, <laughs> okay? And he probably thinks those cherry blossoms are like, you know, inedible, right? So for him, cherry blossoms, plus he, you know, I don't know if the, I'm not sure the woodchuck can look up and admire the beautiful cherry blossoms. I don't know, not a woodchuck. So, um, but anyway, I think what Dogen's talking about here is that, you know, things are what they are, no matter what you call them, all right? I mean, the, the naming, you know, we're saying, yeah, language is kind of arbitrary. It's extremely useful. You create these conventional truths. Um, and I was trying to say earlier how they, we also get caught. It causes suffering, right? Language is just a very powerful tool. And we also somehow like imprison ourselves in language. So, so the idea was to kind of not stop talking altogether, but stop being trapped in your own and, and concepts. And of course, a lot of them, I mean, they're not really our own. We learn them. They're embedded in the language. Um, so, but use language and don't be um, injured by it. Use language and don't be uh, imprisoned in it. Use it in a way that doesn't make you or others suffer. I think that's sort of the, the, the basic message. Anyway, this gets very poetic. Um, and so moving on to practice and verify the 10,000 dharmas while advancing self is called delusion. So you know, a, a major theme here is Dogen talking about what is delusion and what is awakening. And, you know, come back to the title. He, he can recognize delusion when he sees it. Like he sees a monk coming into the gate and he can tell that monk has got some idea in his head, like I'm going to get awakening, you know. Um, and that's deluded. And, he, and Dogen goes on, we're going to come to it in a minute here, where he, where he says what it's, what it's like to be awakened. So he's claiming some kind of awakening for himself. Um, but here you get a definition form. So he says to practice and verify the 10,000 dharmas while advancing self. And the verb here is, is a hakobite, it means like to carry forward, you know, it's called delusion. So I'm not really sure what he means here. The, the opposite is to practice and verify self while the 10,000 dharmas or all the things of the world advance is called awakening. Um, I think, you know, to put this into plain English, if, if you think it's about me and I want to get awakening and I'm going to learn about the world, you're sort of off to the wrong start. He seems to be saying, you should be looking carefully at the world and figuring out what's going on there. And then you'll come to realize what that word me or self really means. Yeah, it's just a word. It's another one of those words. Okay. Um, anyway, here's, this is my all time favorite line from Dogen. And, um, he, two lines, two sentences. He says, those who greatly awaken to delusion are Buddhas. Those who are greatly deluded about awakening are living beings. So notice, so, you know, Buddhas are awakened. They, they have satori or awakening. Okay. Deluded beings are deluded. Okay. But what makes a Buddha a Buddha is that not that they're free from delusion, they're awakened to delusion. In other words, Buddhas know they're deluded. A Buddha is someone who knows they're deluded. That's really interesting. People who don't think they're deluded, well, they are. And they're not Buddhas. 
okay? <laughs> I, I always, I, I like to tell my students, my job as a professor is to get you good and confused because certainty is a mark of stupidity, okay? All right, and um, says the professor with great certainty all the time. Like, listen to me, I know what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, but here, Dogen saying, Buddhas are, have awakened to their own delusion. They're not totally free from it. Okay? Um, and then, those who are greatly deluded about awakening are living beings. Now, who's the greatly deluded about awakening? Yeah, like all of us who are thinking, oh, awakening, awesome. I read about it in DT Suzuki. That's for me. They say that if you get awakening, all your problems are over. You'll be happy forever. You know, like your marital problems, your financial problems, your health problems, your depression, all going to be solved by awakening. Please, right? Or that even, even if you're like, eh, I, I'm fine, I'm cool, I, you know. But if you think there is such a thing as awakening, that is being greatly deluded about awakening. Okay? Now, wait a minute. Dogen's using the word awakening. He's saying there is awakening. He's saying there's a difference between awakening and delusion, but he's already told you, don't cling to those words. There's actually no such thing, okay? Keep it in mind. This is all metaphorical. There's no such thing. There's something like that, okay? There's something closer to awakening and closer to delusion, just like there's something closer to round and closer to square. Okay, but there's nothing perfectly round. So anyway, and then he goes on. He says, moreover, there are people who attain awakening on a top of awakening. And there are people who are further deluded in the midst of delusion. This is really interesting. Uh, how could that be? You know, let's say you have an awakening. It happens. It's just, you know, means that you understand something that you didn't understand. And it feels good. It's like, awesome, I get it. I understand something. You know, it's like a eureka moment. It could be a math problem, you know? It could be like where I left my keys last week. Okay? I don't care what it is. You know? Suddenly, oh, I remember. That's, of course, I put them in my pants and they're in the laundry, right? Okay. That's an awakening, right? Um, of some sort. So, but you have this Buddhist kind of awakening. It's like, I get it. I'm deluded. I understand that. You know, I actually really hope that when I first described this, some of you are saying to yourself, awesome, I get that. Buddhists realize that they themselves are deluded. Cool. All right. However, you take your awakening and you start to reify it. Like, I have an awakening. I understand something. Okay? I'm better than you. I, now, I'm Roshi now because, you know, I got awakening. Huh? You know. All right. That, you have to look at that and say to yourself, that is a, no, that's a delusion. Remember, there's no such thing as awakening. What are you talking about? You have awakening. Okay? And that's awakening on top of awakening. Are you done? No. Because whatever you reify and wherever you sit down and say, I'm done, well, you're deluded. Okay? You know, this is what Dogen means by sustained practice. It's like never ending practice. He gets really pissed off at other Zen teachers who say, Zazen is a way to gain awakening. And once you, once you have awakening, well, you know, Zazen is kind of a pain, so you don't have to do it anymore. You know, um, do something else. Sleep, you know, play around in your garden, drink tea. When you're hungry, eat. When you're tired, sleep. Yeah, who needs Zazen, okay? You know, because it's like a means to an end. And, and Dogen's really, uh, he's, nope, there's no end. 
And Zazen is just what Buddhas do. That's the activity of Buddhas, you know. So you, 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 you don't stop doing it. There's no end. There's no final goal. So if you think there's a final goal called awakening, that's delusion. And if you think you attained awakening, that's delusion. All right. And of course, this we don't have any trouble under, uh, accepting, right? There are people who are further deluded in the midst of delusion. Yeah, there are. That's for sure. Just, um, and, you know, that's, look on the internet. It's all fed. Delusion in the midst of delusion. You know, that's Facebook. It's Twitter. That's conspiracy theories and all kinds of craziness, you know. Um, in other words, there's no end to awakening. You can go, you can get better and better. And there's no bottom. <laughs> Sorry. Just when you thought it can't get any worse. Right? You know what I'm talking about. All right. Um, and then he says, when Buddhas are truly Buddhas, they make no use of perceiving and knowing that their own selves are Buddhas. That's pretty clear now based on what we've discussed, right? A Buddha's not walking around thinking I'm a Buddha. Like the instant a Buddha thinks I'm a Buddha, they're not. Okay. Um, however, you know, the, you know the, but he says, nevertheless, they are verified Buddhas. They go on verifying Buddha. Okay. Um, so you have this, I mean, constant self-contradiction. Can you, I mean, you have to have a big tolerance for self-contradiction to, to uh, you know, live with these Zen texts. Because he's constantly giving it to you in, as conventional truth and then taking it back from the standpoint of ultimate truth. No such thing, no such thing, right? So, you know, I earlier I used the example of democracy. I don't know why, but yeah, I mean, we have to fight to protect our democracy. It's under threat right now. That is a conventional truth. And plus, there's no such thing as democracy, okay? That, that, that's how these people are talking. That's how Dogen's talking here. What do you mean there's no such thing as democracy? What, are you denying it, right? What are you, an authoritarian? No, no. I'm just saying that democracy is a word. It has all these meanings. It's a very complicated thing. It's not one simple thing. Right? And how do you know when you have it? It's an aspiration. It's like round. Let's keep aspiring for it. Okay? Make that ball bearing as round as you can. Let's be as democratic as we can. And there's no such thing. Okay. Um, you know, also, since um, race is such a big issue right now, a very hot topic, um, as it should be, you know, I say beings who know they're deluded are Buddhas, okay? Uh, people who know they're racist, like I'm one of them, are those who are trying to get rid of racism, okay? And if you're saying, oh, I'm not, not me, no, 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 okay, that makes you a racist. So you have to accept, you know, look in yourself and see, yeah, I have those ideas. Yeah, I learned them. Yeah, they're there, you know? And um, I sometimes think them spontaneously. I don't like that. I want to get rid of that. I hate that, okay? Uh, but, you know, recognizing that it's there and, 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 and sort of realizing that's part of, you know, who we are, that, that's actually part of the antidote, okay? So you can make progress. Anyway, um, so uh, this next passage, I, I don't know if, how if I, if I should keep going through this line by line probably don't have time to do the whole thing. Let me, you know, I'm, I'm going to skip down and do some of the more famous ones from this, from, from Genjo Koan. Th this is a really famous passage. To study the way of the Buddhas is to study oneself. To study oneself is to forget oneself. To forget oneself is to be brought to realization by the 10,000 dharmas or things. 
to be brought to realization by the 10,000 dharmas is to cause a sloughing off of the body and mind of one's own self. Um, as well as the bodies and minds of other selves, there is an ending of the traces of awakening which causes one to endlessly move away from the traces of awakening resulting from that ending. Oh boy, you know, that last sentence, that I gotta say reading it is virtually incomprehensible. I mean, that's a mess, okay? Now you can go see what uh, Carl did to fix it up. I gotta tell you, his is incomprehensible too. I, I got a long footnote on there. And I just really, really struggled with that. I'm, 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 you know, my long footnote, if you go read it, I'm not gonna like, kind of explains what I, what I think's going on here. The traces of awakening are sort of what's left after you have some kind of awakening. You, know, you could call that an experience if you want, or it's an understanding if you want. Like, oh, I get it. You know, then the traces are this thing that you're clinging on to. Oh, I have an understanding. Um, you know, there, you, we reify our own understanding and like almost give it a name. And as soon as you do that, you've misrepresented it. Okay. Yeah, you have an understanding. That's conventionally true. But on the level of ultimate truth, no, you don't have that kind of understanding. You have to drop that and move on, okay? And I think, I think that's what he's talking about here. Endlessly move away. So you're never done practice. You can become closer and closer to being a real Buddha, you know? Um, but the moment you stop and rest on your laurel, so to speak, and say, I'm a Buddha, I'm done, you know, well, then you're not. And Buddhas don't do that. So, you know, there, there is, in a lot of Zen literature, you see this, like, you get awakened in an instant of thought. But even a Buddha in an instant of thought, if they attach to it, can become instantly deluded. And, you know, I, I've been talking about this contradiction back and forth. But in some sense, it's like, yes, we're awakened. And yes, we're deluded at the same time. Like, you got, you, you know, this is moving past the dualism, this is past either or. It's actually not past the dualism because you're still, you're still dividing up awakening from delusion. Okay. That's some kind of arbitrary distinction. But if we're going to make that distinction for the sake of the Buddha Dharma, then you have to realize, um, yeah, I'm always going to be deluded and I can become more and more aware of that and more and more awakened. And, um, you know, there's, I, I, I did use that example of, of recognizing your own racism, but part of the implicit thing about when you realize delusion, it kind of, you don't have to suppress it. You don't have to extirpate it. You don't have to cut it off. It just, when delusion gets exposed as delusion, it just sort of shrivels up and slinks away. You know, it's just like, oh, sorry, I, I you're, you're right. Uh, it's kind of stupid. Bye. Okay, that's delusion slinking away. <laughs> and and then you are thinking to yourself, ha, gotcha, got rid of you, delusion, or got rid of you. I'm not. I listen. I totally got rid of my racism. You know, at, at, at exactly that point. Well, it's back. Okay. And, you know, so we're always sort of in both. I, I don't know. I think that's what Dogen's saying. Um, anyway, eh. you know, I went on a whole hour and here, okay, let's, uh, maybe I'll just look at one more passage. Oh no, um, I'll look at two more passages. Two more. He, I'm not going to have time to do the whole text, okay, at, at this level. Uh, but here's, a, this is an example. Now, Dogen's really trying hard to use uh, a metaphor 
that anyone could understand. He's being very compassionate here. He says, when people ride in a boat, if they turn their eyes and gaze at the shore, they make the mistake of thinking that the shore is moving. When they fix their eyes more closely on the boat, they understand that it's the boat that's advancing. Um, so similarly, in focusing on the 10,000 dharmas with a confused conception of body and mind, one makes the mistake of thinking that one's own mind and own being are eternally abiding. abiding. So that's the Buddhist idea you know, of no self. Like we all think we have a self or a soul or some kind of, like there's this uh, uh, transcendental unity of apperception. That's what Kant called it, you know, or sukito ergo sum. I mean, that's what Descartes called it. Like this is feeling like I'm here. Okay. I exist. I don't care what you say. And I can see the world out there. Okay. And, you know, I'm sort of the same and the world changes. And Dogen says, yeah, that's the normal way of looking at things. Um, and he's, that's like a person riding in a boat, looking at the shore, and they think the shore is moving. It's a fundamental misperception. Um, so actually, if, if you look at things, do you see them arising and ceasing, you know, in a causal nexus, you see that there really are no things exactly the way we imagine them. You could divide things up differently. Um, and with that, you come to a realization of what yourself really is. And it's not a thing. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I want to just do one more passage. Uh, you know, we got firewood and ashes, which is a really interesting one. Uh, it's too philosophical. Uh, I think I'm going to move down to uh, moon and a dewdrop, because this is where I'm going to close with this passage. Uh, and then we can open it up to discussion after another break. Okay. Um, so a person's attainment of awakening, and here he uses the word satori, okay, just like DT Suzuki, um, is like the moon resting in water. So you have a vivid poetic image there. Imagine, you know, it's night, you're looking at a calm lake or river or ocean, and you can see the moon reflected in the water beautiful sight. Um, the moon does not get wet and the water is not disturbed. Yeah, the moon's in the water, but yeah, it doesn't get wet, right? The moon is intruding on the water and does it make any waves? No. Okay. Uh, so if you did happen to have any awakening, it's not going to make any waves. And it's not going to like do anything to you. You're not going to become moon like. Yeah, I, you know, he's just saying awakening is not going to change you a bit any more than, you know, the water wets the moon or the moon just makes waves in the water. So, what is he talking about? Uh, anyway, keep going. He says, although its illumination is far reaching and great, the moon, I mean, the moon is a symbol of awakening and all, you know, like um, we have all these basic Buddhist metaphors that use the moon. The most, two of the most famous, moon in the water, moon covered by clouds and finger pointing at the moon. Those are, uh, those are the three most famous. The moon covered by clouds is all living beings inherently have the Buddha nature. We're all Buddhas already. But, and our own mind is Buddha. But because our mind is obscured by deluded greed, uh, you know, greed, by afflictions, greed, hatred, and delusion, that's like clouds in the sky, so you can't see the moon. But if you blow the clouds away, you get rid of your greed, hatred, and delusion, the moon's been there all along. Your, your own Buddha mind has been there all along shining brightly, so you get rid of your delusion and you see that, oh yeah, I've been a Buddha. I already am a Buddha. I've been a Buddha all along. That's the moon and the clouds. Okay, finger pointing at the moon is another famous one. Um, so a person talking about awakening is like a person pointing at the moon in the sky. Um, if you keep staring at their finger, 
you'll never see the moon. You have to take your eye off their finger and look up. In fact, you know, pointing is a very sophisticated mode of communication. And I sort of find myself wondering, you know, at what level among animals do they get smart enough? I think apes are smart enough to figure out pointing. I'm, I'm sure dogs aren't. You can't point and say, you know, Fido, there's your food. You know, it doesn't work, right? He's looking at your finger. He'll keep looking at your finger. Okay, so when, when, when you talk about awakening, that's the finger, right? You have to forget that word and look away to it and find something else, okay? You know, find what it's talking about, which is not that, okay? So now the moon and the water is, is also, uh, I mean, a, a kind of image of actually of um, seeing awakening very like clearly and, 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 and in a sort of beautiful setting. So it, it, it's, not a, it's not really an image of delusion. It's an image of awakening to see the moon in the water, even though it's reflected, right? It's like, you think you're gonna see the real thing directly, but all we ever get is a reflection. That's the best you can hope for. And, and, and the reflection's good, that's, that's good enough, okay? Um, so anyway, so he goes on, even the whole moon or the entire sky rests in just the dew on a blade of grass or rests in just a single drop of water. You know, so a single drop of dew on a blade of grass or a single drop of water, what's that? That's you. That's each of us. That's what we are. We're just a single drop of water in, the, in this vast universe, you know, and yet you know, you can reflect the entire moon. You can, you can reflect awakening like that, okay? And he says, that a person does not obstruct awakening is just like a dewdrop's failure to obstruct the sky or moon. Now, um, that which is deep calls for a scale of measurement that is lofty. As for the length of the occasion, one must check whether it's a great amount of water, a small amount of water. You know, okay, go read what Carl says about that. I can't make any sense out of it. I'm sorry. You know, um, I mean, it, it, I think he meant something. You know, why is he suddenly talking about measurement? Um, I, I'm actually not really sure. I mean, he said how something vast like the moon and the sky can be contained in a single drop of water, right? Without disturbing it. Um, but anyway, so just to, to close out here, he's saying that awakening it's going to make all the difference, but it doesn't make any difference. So, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, awakening is going to be some experience for me. Like I'm suddenly going to see the light and jump up and say, I got it, I got it. Right? And, and people do have those kinds of experiences, not just with koans and Buddhism, but with finding your keys and math problems, okay? Those are real experiences, okay? I'm not saying they, they don't exist. You can have a real enlightenment experience awakening like that, okay? Um, but Dogen here seems to be cautioning us, saying, yeah, well, real awakening doesn't stir you up like that. It doesn't change anything like that. It's something remote. It, it's like the moon in the water. It doesn't shake up the water. Okay. Now, you know, I'm not going to, it's not, you can think about that. You get that image. I mean, it's kind of problematic. You're practicing Buddhism. Don't you want your awakening to make you a better person? Like, you know, I mean, I, it, you know, I use this racism example. Yeah, I don't want to be a racist. I, you know, I, I want to see it and get rid of it if I can. But I know I'm always going to be, you know, like that. So, um, but maybe awakening isn't that kind of thing. That's what he seems to be saying. But, but you know, it can get deeper and deeper. Maybe that's why he's talking about measurement. You know, is waking on top of awakening. There's delusion on top of delusion. You know, um, you never end. Thank okay. you so much, Griffiths. Really uh, privileged to get to get your take on this text, which we've 
Um, we've studied ourselves in the past more than once, but yeah. uh, it's really, you know, it, it looks very different coming back to it and in your translation. I had a couple of minor questions, but I had one major question, which is going back to the title. Okay. So oh, maybe yeah, I, you know, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I forgot to come uh, back to that. that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, that really struck me that the first of all, to get your title, I had no idea what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, and then I read the footnote, the first footnote, um, where you kind of laid it out and yeah. It actually, it w I found it shocking in a way, and I also found it very uh, compelling. Yeah. I mean, uh, it made a lot of sense to me, and it seemed like you were able to come to that conclusion, in fact, from this whole uh, technological revolution of the digitalized well, canon. Well, was pretty famous. You know, it was, it was oh, really? quoted by Yun Mun. Yeah, it was, it's been known in the tradition. I see. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that kind of raises the question of why people didn't yeah, pick why up on it more. Yeah, let me answer that about why the title, okay? I know you have follow-up. I, I want just to say a, a little bit more on, on that. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if you are, if this is your argument about what Genjo Koan means, how you, uh, how you view the alternative translation, like the yeah. Shohaku Komura and so forth, and right, right. Why, why you find one, uh, the, the other one less convincing. Yeah. I'm also curious to know, um, you said that Carl dis Carl wanted to play it safe with the Soto school, so he went back well, to real realizing. I mean, also, you know that maybe that's not fair to him. Maybe he also thinks I'm just wrong, you know. And well, that's what I was yeah, going to ask yeah. you. Does he actually agree with you or no, not? You know, okay. I, I, and I could tell you the nature. You know, it's quite interesting. It's a it's a friendly disagreement. You know, um, you you know with with words and meaning, it's not either or, right? Words start with one meaning and they gain other meanings. You know, you know, you, you know. Th think about, um, and we also tend to think that the same word should have, like, all the meanings of a word should have something in common, but they don't. You know, like, we call a computer mouse uh, a mouse because it looked like a mouse rodent with a tail, right? But then you get a wireless mouse. It doesn't look like the rodent, right? We call a person a, a mouse because they're timid like of mice and men, you know. And what does a, a wireless computer mouse have to do with a timid person? They're both called mice, nothing, okay? So words change their meaning. And koan, I'm pointing out, like the first use of this word in Zen text, it's a metaphor for a, uh, a court of law, okay? And, and, you know, that's a philological historical fact. That's not like just my interpretation. That's where the word koan comes into the Zen tradition. But, but then later, any fixed saying of a Zen master that was repeated, like seemed interesting or deep, or was going to be raised as a topic of discussion to test students or students raise it to test teachers, those got called koan. So it became the name, this is an extension of the meaning. It's first a metaphor, like I'm the judge, you're the accused, I find you guilty. It, as if this were a case in court. And then all these other records of discussions between masters and disciples get called cases in court. The court, that's, and they're also called kolsoku, which means an old case. So a koan is really a case in court and it can be, so if a, if a, a Roshi, a Zen master is asked to comment on a case, it's like, well, they're, the, they're, they're a higher court. You know, they have the record of the earlier court decision and they, they can still have a further um, finding on it. But now, why did Dogen use that in the title? And, and here, I want to tie this together because I neglected and, and thank you for putting your finger on it, all right? Because I meant to. So what's an obvious case? Like the, the master sees the monk coming in and because he's seeking the Dharma, he's obviously deluded, okay? But I take Dogen to mean he looks at him, himself and he realizes, I am obviously deluded. He's judging himself. Look at you, Dogen, you're deluded. And that, you know, that makes him a Buddha by his definition, right? Because Buddhas are ones who are greatly awakened to delusion. So if, if you look at your own mind and you say, yeah, I'm deluded, you're passing judgment like that master. 
Okay. And so that's why I think that's there. Uh, you know, the follow up part of your question. Um, I just ask you about that, the koan sure. part. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the other translation of Genjo koan that I've come across, uh, like in Shohaku Komura, is they, they talk about the koan side of it as representing, let's say, the law, right? You get the, the, the court and the law case, but it's about the law. It's about, in a sense, the publicness, which is the universal aspect of things as opposed to the yeah. phenomenal aspect of things right. so yeah. genjo koan would mean the fusion of the the relative and absolute or something like that that's that, the other translation i've seen i'm wondering what you think there's of that. i think there's something to say for that and i'll tell you why because there was a, a chan master of the yuan dynasty called uh jung fun ming bun and um he defined koan he said Koan means public document, like a law of the empire. And, and his text and his definition of koan was very prevalent, understood in Japan, very common among Japanese Zen. So, you know, now that's an extension of the meaning of koan. The first meaning is purely metaphorical. Then it, then it comes to mean um, a, any saying that's held up like a case, court case, and there are a whole bunch of them. But once you get to the point with Jung von Mingban in the Yuan dynasty, uh, he's saying, we have a sort of set number of these cases. And, you know, this tests you for whether you're really a, a Chan master or not. You have to be able to, you know, solve these cases. This is like the law of the land. This, this is what keeps phonies out and frauds and, you know, vagrants and vagabonds. You know, it's like the law of the country keeps the peace of the land and maintains a sort of sense of, um, well, authority too, right? Religious authority. So that is a meaning. I say that's a secondary meaning, okay? Mm -hmm. um, now, when you get down to 20th century Japan, I think, and, and especially in modern, uh, as translated in America, people are thinking like this. Well, a koan is some kind of Zen riddle or problem, okay? I mean, that's really not accurate. It's not a riddle. It, 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 it's, it's a saying that's demanding commentary, okay? That's different than a riddle. Um, but okay, a, a pro, a, your, your Roshi gives you a koan and it's like your problem and you have to solve it, okay? And, um, you know, and then people like Americans say stuff like, yeah, my marriage is my koan, you know? And, <laughs> you know? My drinking is my koan, you know, you know, my whatever, you know, and they're using koan metaphorically, meaning sort of a major problem in my life. So um, I think this modern Soto take, like where uh, uh, Shohaku Okumura is or, or Kaz Tanahashi, you know, they're saying, okay, Dogen doesn't mean koan like the Rinzai koans, which are sayings of masters. He means, well, we find ourselves alive in this world and that's kind of a big problem. The world is my, you know, my existence is my koan. I have to solve the problem of why am I here? What's the meaning of this? What's going on? You know, so like the world as koan, okay? Now, honestly, I don't think there's any precedent for this before the 20th century, okay? And I think it's influenced by Western psychology too, frankly, because DT Suzuki, you know, the, the, the people who are reforming Soto Zen already knew English, already were, you know, thinking that superstition and religion is bad, meaningless ritual, you know, they're like, sort of, this is like the Protestant reaction against the Catholic Church, you know, the Enlightenment in the West means religion is superstitious, get rid of ritual and mumbo jumbo, right? Um, see it for yourself, like rational. So, you know, these Western ideas of, of getting rid of superstition, sort of rationality, firsthand experience, and, and sort of like a psychological take on Buddhism became prevalent in early 20th century Japan. And it's influence coming from the West. So, you know, that the world is my koan, never mind my marriage is my koan. I mean, these, these are 20th century new things. Okay. Now, look, does new mean bad? Does it mean wrong? No, because words change in meaning, the meanings go on and on and on, you know? You know, I mean, I, 
I you can name your dog koan, right? <laughs> and what's stopping you? Nothing. Okay. There's a new meaning. What's koan? Hmm, rover over there. Okay. So right. And so I mean, Carl and I are arguing over this. I want to say, look, you you know, I want to keep the quotation marks on because I'm I'm pretty sure Dogen has this one case in mind. And Carl says, get over it, Griff. You're like stuck in some kind of literal original reading. You know, like the tradition moved on. Dogen means something metaphysical. Okay. Mm. And, and, you know, you can make a pretty good argument for that. Okay. And I'm not saying Dogen doesn't. Okay. I'm just saying, I don't want us to lose sight of like, you know, the etymology there. Cause I think the etymology is important. I, now, I, yeah. I was just going to say, if, since you were superseded in this case, cause he's the head editor, head editor, yeah. it would be great for you to publish your own version I of this. I will, first. you know, I, uh, I promised there was some, there was some magazine, I forget, uh, France. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I sort of said once I would, and then I'm like really busy, so I never did it. But I saw, I mean, like, I'm the kind of, I'm, unfortunately for my scholarly career, I was never very careerist. So I have like this vast library of unpublished stuff. So I just, like, I just gave it to you guys, right? There's my year. I just published it. You got it. Go spread it around. Okay. Put, put it up on the web. Okay. <laughs> no, but I, I, I yeah, I, I, I think I will eventually get around to, to publishing that, you know. Great, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I want to jump in with a personal question. I'm very willing to accept the proposition that I'm deluded. Yeah. But if I'm deluded, how can I diagnose my own delusion? I mean, isn't my delusion such that I'm not able to perceive properly my own delusion? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, probably yes, because you just told me that. <laughs> so I'm stuck. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that about me, okay? And and Dogen doesn't say it about him. So, you know, are you stuck? Well, if I think in the you're stuck, you got to work hard. Listen, you he, he, you, there's a way out of that. There really is. Mm. And, and, you know, that's called having faith. Oh. You know, I mean, because, you, you, know, you know, why should you take my word for it? Maybe, maybe I'm, you know, a big blowhard. You know, there are plenty of people around, like, making money and making themselves famous and getting prestige off of being Zen masters. It's really pathetic. Okay? Mm. And, you know, they're going to hell. That's what Buddhists would say. Okay. In the next rebirth. You know, um, so, you know, but I do think if you've ever solved a problem where you're confused and then you figured it out, you have that as a model. And of course you have many, many, many times. I'm, I'm, I'm Nancy Kerrigan and I've just gotten a little awakening, <laughs> but I know it's not an awakening. So once I've got that little awakening that I know it's not a little awakening, do I ever get closer to learning why me? And from Dogen's perspective, from your perspective. Yeah, I think you get closer, yeah, yeah. You know, look, uh, there's two scales here. Like conventionally, you get closer. You're definitely closer, you're better off. But do you ever actually get there, you know, all the way, 100%? No, that, that, that's all. I, I mean, look, we, we strive, like, if you're a historian, you're, you're striving for something called objectivity, you know. Well, this story, like, what? You, you, you always have a point of view. You always have something you're interested in that you're studying, you know. Uh, you know and, and so how are you ever going to obtain objectivity? It's, it's, it's not possible, and yet that's what you strive for. And you make progress. You can get better. You can, a historian can be more and more objective. You know, and, and uh, so, you know, I think I'm answering your question. 
Yes. Like, yeah, you, you, sure, you're going to make progress. It's just like Dogen's cautioning, don't think you're done. You know? Like, I don't know who would, but I mean, he had people running around in his day saying, I'm done, I'm awakened, you know. I mean, actually, if you if you take the sort of underlying philosophy of innate Buddhahood or Buddha, innate Buddha mind or innate Buddha nature, all living beings are already Buddhas, all right? So you can understand that on some intellectual level and you can say, well, I'm done, I'm a Buddha, all right? And, and, and there, were, there were people in Japan who are saying, using that to excuse all kinds of bad behavior, you know? It's a kind of antinomia, like if you, everyone, I'm a Buddha, you know, there's no, there's no good or bad, there's no evil, you know? Uh, so um, anyway, the, the, I think he was arguing against people who, who were trying to say, you know, yeah, I'm done, I'm a Buddha. And, you know, and he's saying, no, you're not because Buddhas don't think that about themselves. Buddhas know they're deluded. Okay. Um, I, th this is a little bit similar to the answer I gave uh, Bokushu just before, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. You're going to make progress. Okay, I'll get up and do Zazen tomorrow. <laughs> you know I, know, I know I'm not there. <laughs> I think a lot of the, uh, I, I, lo I love a lot of the, the beat Buddhists, but I think some of their uh, philosophies are a little bit like the uh, the people who uh, knew they yeah. have Buddhahood, therefore they're there. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you're talking about Dharma bums and Jack Kerouac? Yeah, yeah. You know, that is a very absurd, I mean, very one-sided, silly, you know, view of Buddhism. I, you know, it just, it's like, it, it's sort of like saying nothing matters. It, it's almost a kind of nihilism, okay? I can do whatever I want. I mean, he, he, that guy's a hedonist, right? His idea is to drive around the country, you know, womanizing, drinking, and engaging in petty crime. That's what he did, okay? And, and okay, and writing. So, so, you know, he's, I mean, you know, I like his books too. I, I don't mean to, you know, but, but that sort of beat view of Zen as liberating. Yeah, I mean, it, maybe that's good for something like you know if you're in the straight laced 1950s where everyone has a khaki and a crew cut and you and you're ready to go get killed in the korean war yeah i think i'd go with jack kerouac <laughs> and alan ginsburg you know um but anyway thank jack you. kerouac didn't end up so happily no. thank you i i mean i had the, the original question i was going to ask um uh, I, I actually uh, really appreciate um, how various times as you were going through the exposition of the text that you said, oh, I, oh, I really don't understand this. And, and then you actually proceeded to give a 10-minute um, discourse that actually just really made it really clear to me. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> that's my best guess, okay? Yeah. When I say I understand it, I mean, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. And, okay. and other people who I respect are not agreeing, you know, so... Yeah. So, so I, I, I wanted to just actually, because um, I've lost uh, several of the places where you did that, I was actually just going to go back to the third sentence or ask yeah. you to go back to the third sentence. And, you know, at least my uh, not understanding of it, um, you know, I can read it or, um, is, or you can put it back up, but it's because the way of the Buddhas from the start has sprung out from fertility and barrenness. It has a rising and cessa cessation. It has delusion and awakening. It has beings and Buddhas. Right. So this reminded, reminds me when I um, uh, uh, read it of, the, of another uh, Dogen quote about, you know, at, at a certain point in our practice, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then at another point, mountains are not mountains, rivers are not rivers. And then, of yeah, course, that's once, very famous. Yeah, right. So, so th in this, the fertility and the barrenness, or in other translations, abundance and scarcity, the the fertility or or abundance is the, is the first part. Um, yeah. When all dharmas are the Buddha right. dharma. That's right. And the barrenness or scarcity is the second part when right. there is nothing. Yep. 
And so, and so after, you know, and, and at, at some level, they're both of equal weight. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, what you're saying there uh, is the standard interpretation. Okay. Okay. And Carl followed it. And um, it takes this, you know, the, the verb there, um, which is chosu, I, I translate it as sprung out. But other people are going to translate that as transcend. Going beyond. Go beyond. Yeah. So Carl, in his note, if you see his note, he, you know, there's a difference. He's very, his notes are really short. Mine are really long. Okay. His note to the first sentence is, well, this, this must be when you look at everything from the point of view of Buddhism. Second sentence, this, you look at everything from the point of view of emptiness. Third sentence, the Chosu, so he says, this is like going beyond that distinction. Which is what you just said, right? And that's a pretty, yeah. that's a pretty in standard interpretation, you know. And I had a feel like a linguistic reason for saying no. When when Dogen uses that verb chosu, he he marks the object of the verb with a with a Japanese particle that marks it as the article. And here he says, it's he says, yori from. He doesn't say transcend something. He says, go out from something. See, so I'm just like really looking carefully at the actual words you use. And that's why my translation is different. And I think he's going back to the first statement, not transcending the two. That's what I think. Okay. And they're both, well, I mean, I'm in the minority. I'm going to have the hard time arguing mine because everybody knows that the other one's right. Okay. So I think that's um, what I'm asking because I, I, I've read enough to... to yeah have come to this quote interpretation which may be yeah. just received wisdom and i was curious why you're hung up on your your lack of well, I, mean, I mean phrase. i do have i mean i'm looking at the verb and the part and the japanese particle it's really nothing more than that okay you know it's, this is not profound it's just like if he meant that he would have used a different particle okay okay and where, where do you get so like this is a process question but like you're saying this is the word that he used but you don't necessarily have the piece of paper that he took his pen oh, no. ink on. <laughs> so no, no. i mean you know we there there are the history of the of the shobo genzo you know th there are uh many different versions with different numbers of chapters so again apparently started to rewrite it late in life and there's a 12 chapter version there's a 75 chapter version a 65 chapter version a 95 chapter version and the history of the text is incredibly complex. And um, actually, William Botterford in, in, is writing a very long and detailed explanation of this in the introduction to our publication of Shobo Genzo, if you're interested. Um, I mean, it gets really technical and it's very, you know, it's like historical uh, detective work to try to figure this stuff out. There are a few things that, that purport to be in Dogen's hand like one uh, scroll of Fukan Zazengi, you know, universal recommendation of Zazen. Um, uh, but pretty much, you know, we're just taking what the modern Soto tradition says, okay, this is the best represent, you know, we picked one version that the administrative headquarters wanted us to use. And that's what we're translating. Yeah. So, but I mean, you're right. You can compare different versions and sometimes there are variations and sometimes those are, are quite revealing. I'm, I'm comparing the same verb elsewhere in, in, in the same version of Shobo Genzo. Elsewhere where it means transcend, he uses a different Japanese particle, like, like, a, like a preposition. Right? So it's, it's just like in English, we would say over or beyond, you know, um, and or out of. And, you know, it's just like a little marker of what that verb is going to mean. Okay. Okay. Cool. No, that's, that's, yeah. that's all. That's all I had. So I think he's coming back to saying, why do we have this discussion of discriminating birth, you know, and death and Buddhas and no Buddhas? Where does this come from? Where does this discriminating stuff come from? Right. Where does the, where does the Buddha way come from? It doesn't like fall down from the sky. Right. It obviously emerges among human beings. Yes. Okay. It emerges with Shakyamuni Buddha. He's just a guy. I mean, you know, okay. 
There's all this mythology about them. But the idea that there's awakening and delusion is something that people thought up. Yeah. So it comes out of the muck of our existence. And that's how I'm taking it, okay? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you. That's yeah. why I went back to it, because yeah. I knew you were struggling, and I wanted to okay, know yeah, what yeah. you were struggling yeah. with. Yeah, you know, <laughs> one thing I'm, listen, I, I don't like translations where they pretend they know what they're talking about when they don't. Right. Yeah. And, and our pledge is, well, we don't know, we're just going to say, we don't know. You know, here's our best guess, because we have to translate it. But it could also mean this, it could also mean that, and that's why you have this huge uh you know annotation mm. that we're publishing mm. and you. actually it lets you make up your mind you know you now have a couple of alternatives here and there's the one you always thought now there's this other idea i gave you i don't know what's exactly at stake here not a whole lot but um you know you you can actually decide our our idea was to give the, the readers who don't read the original the tools to make your own decisions, you know, like that's that's a step to a, a Western Buddhism, right? Mm. So you're not like totally always stuck behind this wall of translation, right? So you can tell me, make up your mind, and let's hear. <laughs> not now, <laughs> any time later. <laughs> I'm I'm really I'm Craig. I'm calling in from San Francisco. I'm I'm so appreciative of this presentation. I really am. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to skip over the firewood section of the Genja Koan as being a little too philosophical. Well, no, I, I was running out of time, and I thought I, I love that section, and I'm Mister, you know, philosophical. <laughs> I was going to start to wax, you know, eloquent about that and probably use up all the rest of the time. So I censored myself. <laughs> <laughs> but my question, yeah. my question is this, thank you. Given the emphasis you've placed in this discussion on um, enlightenment and then delusion, yeah, I'd like to know how to put a handle on the firewood section of this. Okay. Why the discussion of the okay. Dharma and the firewood in it? Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I, I'll I'll just talk a little bit about it. So, um, he he says you shouldn't think that firewood becomes ashes. Firewood holds the Dharma position of firewood, and ashes hold the Dharma position of ashes. Now he says firewood has a past, present, and future, and ashes have a past, present, and future. Right. So, in other words, you can be firewood, and in the Dharma position of firewood, you can say, I used to be a tree, I used to be a sapling, I got cut down, I'm split, I'm dried, I'm ready to burn. Or, you know, or you can say, I'm firewood, and I'm going to be ashes, but right now, you're firewood, okay? You have a past and a future, but you're just what you are now. And, and then ashes, same, right? Same thing. So, ashes have the Dharma position of ashes. Now, what does that mean, Dharma position? When we name something, this is about two truths and, and, and the function of language. When you call something firewood, do you call ashes firewood? No. And if you try to burn the ashes, will it work? No, and that's why you don't call them ashes, okay? All right, so we're the ones who think that a thing is what it is. Firewood's firewood. Ashes are ashes, okay? And, you know, we divide the world up that way, okay? If you wanna look at it from the standpoint of ultimate truth, there's no such thing as firewood or ashes, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you wanna look at it conventionally, conventionally, of course we say firewood burns up and becomes ashes. I mean, he's not, you think Dogen's literally saying, never say that again? He, yeah, that's like too dumb. <laughs> He's not saying that. <laughs> Everybody knows, right? He's, he's, I think he's trying to point out something about the disjunction between language and the real world. When you call something firewood, you're acting as if it's one thing that'll always be that thing. Firewood is firewood forever. 
is there anything in the real world that's firewood forever? No, I don't care if you don't burn it, the sun will burn it, you know, 500 billion years from now when it expands, right? It's gonna get burnt, all right? It's not staying firewood. But, but, but when we think firewood, it's like a platonic form, right? That's what a dharma is. It's, it, it is what it is, it's not other things. Each dharma holds its own dharma place. A firewood is firewood forever. You know, and that's why actually there's no such thing. Nothing's forever. So therefore, there's no firewood, okay? <laughs> that's what he's getting at. <laughs> All right? I see, I see. Make sense? <laughs> it does, to a degree. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. All right. Um, it's more of a statement looking for some commentary. Um, you know, I started... Um, with Zen back in the 70s, the early 70s, and uh, fell away because it was a very traditional practice. Yeah. Philip Kaplow's uh, oh, song, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. And um, I, I read a lot, and I found the text to be so opaque Yeah. that, you know, as you were saying, the allusions uh, were, were illusions for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's just they were uh, impenetrable because I had none of the background. Yeah. And I just, uh, I so appreciate what you're doing here and what you've done. And that goes for our teachers too, bringing it into the moment. Yeah. Right. And uh, we need these words, which are fingers. Right, sure. They're fingers. And um, I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't. I nothing to say except you know you and I are, must be the same age. You know, Philip Kaplan. I mean, I graduated from college in '71, and you know, I remember I went to graduate school at University of Michigan. I'd or, I'd already been in Japan and already practicing Zen, and I showed yeah. up, and there was this Zen house, and it was all it was Ken Kraft. Did you know Ken Kraft? No. You know, he, he was a follower of you know Kaplow, and later on, and became a professor. And he said, well, "If you're going to live here, you have to be a student of Roshi Kaplow." Yes. Right. And I'm like, uh, well, I actually have a Roshi in Japan, you know? And <laughs> so I couldn't live there. Anyway, that just brings back that memory. Another attack. And, you know, and, and in a way, that's the same kind of turnoff that you're telling me about, right? It's a different sort of thing, but mm. yeah. The, the, it, it's kind of amazing that the people would put up with incomprehensible. I mean, a lot of it's due to the translation. It's bad. And then some of it's due to uh, just the difficulty of the original language, right? And all the well, judging by uh, yeah. you know seven hundred what pages of glossary or wh whatever, yeah. there's a lot yeah. behind it that that could be helped to uh, illuminate. Yeah, where you're coming from? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm just some kind of weirdo who who really wanted to understand those texts, you know, and and I. And it's a work, like I said, it's a work in progress. I, I've been studying them for 40 years. Right. I'm getting better and better. You know, the, there's nothing like translating because it really forces you to understand. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm holding myself to the standard. If you don't understand it, don't translate it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, um, yeah, but, you know, every, you could... The, the tradition in many ways is opaque and it, I mean for me too even though even if I can read the Chinese something's opaque to me isn't it I mean I, I'm not in the world of Song Dynasty China I'm, right. I'm missing half their even if I think I'm so smart I figured out this or that one it's I'm like reading the old English text. The majority of them you know yeah it's like reading old English texts and the metaphors exactly. don't yeah. yeah you know so anyway right but thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, first, thank you very much. I've taken, I think, 14 pages of completely diluted notes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. Well, make sure uh, to go burn them. And I'm about to ask a why question, which is also illegal, but I'm going to do it. Okay. Uh, I'm really sad that I am going to go on being diluted. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what I do. And why? I, and, <laughs> and I just need to know... If that's because there's something about the human mind, whatever, wherever thoughts are being secreted, yeah. and that's 
the cause of my delusion. And if somehow I was able to sit in nirvana and never have another, another thought, I could escape the illusion. However, why isn't it the case though that even having a thought, if I'm just thinking that is what's happening in the moment, yeah. so how is that necessarily deluded? Keep thinking about it. <laughs> You're close. If you keep thinking like that, you'll get, you'll understand something. <laughs> Cause that's called introspection and that's called contemplation. Diluted is just a name. Come on. I mean, it, it's, it's diluted only because, you know, we look at the world and we divide it up. We draw all these lines in the world to make sense of it for ourselves. And we, we have to do that. Okay. And the lines aren't really there. That's all. Right. So, okay. So yeah. if I, if I go outside yeah. and I need to walk around yeah, <laughs> and I, I need to have a conversation with someone. Yeah. So I need to use concepts and words. Yeah. Go ahead. That. Right. But all of that is going to be built on the narrative that you I know, would it, listen, it, it, tendencies it, and all of that. So there's no way out as long as no, I, no, no, absolutely no way out. There's the, the, the only way, the only way out is to realize what you're, what you're stuck in. If you realize what you're stuck in, you're out and still in. Okay. That's it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Go take a walk and talk to someone using concepts and you're allowed to use your watch too, even though there's no such thing as time. I'm going to get an iPod, an Apple watch and get more. <laughs> All right. Um, so I wanted to thank you for a, an amazing ramble through all of this. Um, it's really, really mind blowing. And, you know, I work as a psychotherapist, so uh, my uh, work is words Yeah. and trying to communicate is such a slippery slope. Oh yeah especially about your own state of mind or feelings. I mean, our language does a lot of things really well, and that's not one of them. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But it's a, a very interesting because people will come in and say, oh, you said that to me, and that was so helpful. Yeah. You said that to me, and that was awful. Yeah, and, yeah. And then we have to try to sort the whole thing out. Yeah using our ideas words. <laughs> yeah, I know. That must that's hard. <laughs> well you have a rough job. I mean, you know, that's a hard job. I mean I I'm a teacher, so it's a little bit like that, but I don't I'm not attempting therapy. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. But you know, you share I think the idea of the the lost in translation yeah. sort of brought that back to me and how yeah. sensitive we have to be about what we're saying and what people are really hearing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I personally have a big problem with that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not good at it. Well, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's perfectly clear what I'm saying. And then, you know, and then I find out, nope. No, nope. there's nope. <laughs> mud. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for okay. an amazing yep. talk. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Griff, thank you for a, a monumental treat. Um, and my question has to do with uh, whether Dogen's more appreciated in the West uh, these days, or what's the status yeah. of his... Um, his significance currently in Japan? Well, might be, might be more appreciated in, in a kind of um, good way that people are reading and interested and intellectually engaged. You know, I mean, within the Soto school in Japan, Logan is deified. Ah. And, you know, that's not good. I think Dogen doesn't want to be deified. And he basically says so in the Genjo Koan, you know? Um, but 
Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of people who um, still are read Dogen seriously and are very interested in Dogen. There are a lot of trans, mod, you know, um, modern Japanese translations of Dogen. Uh, there, there's the idea that I, I think people are interested in Dogen as part of Japanese intellectual history and Japanese cultural history, who maybe aren't even that into Buddhism. There, there was an attempt in the early 20th century to uh, present Dogen to the world as a great Japanese intellectual or deep thinker. You know, I was sort of joking about that with Heidegger and, and Hegel, but you know, I'm, that's only half kidding. I mean, so he, he's widely recognized in Japan as this genius and maybe some kind of God, you know, like deified within the Soto school, um, which I don't know. Um, you can think about the Bible as the word of God. Does that make people analyze it more carefully or not? You know, <laughs> for a lot of people, it just makes, you know, they take their own opinion and think that God has approved it. And there they go, you know. <laughs> So how would, just to flip it, how would Dogen feel about the, uh, about Zen Buddhism in Japan? Today? I, I don't know. I mean, look, he was always pretty caustic in his criticism of what he saw as phonies and um, people in it for the money. Uh, and, you know, so I guess he would be kind of caustic and critical. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I, I mean, but I, I, I think he would recognize some people as, as sincere and genuine too. You know, it's like what else is new, right? In any, <laughs> yeah. I uh, since we're almost out of time, I just yeah. wanted to say, uh, you know, you're so refreshing. You're oh, yeah? just delightful. It's been just terrific to listen today. I've studied this uh, for so many years, and oh boy. You yeah. gave us a lot of fresh ideas. I'm so delighted. Thank you. Oh, great. Fresh is good, I guess. Right? Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For me to have an audience like you is thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know this, Roshi. The students make the teacher, right? There's no such thing as a teacher just sitting there by yourself. <laughs> so you owe your students, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, thank you, everybody. All right. Okay. Bye.